call the meeting to order. Can everybody please turn off your cell phones and then when you've done that, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to call for approval of a flexible agenda. Second. Vote on it. Who's the, Dave, Dave, make the motion. Yeah, I made a motion. Oh, flexible mean, agenda. Yeah. Okay. okay. Do it in the microphone. Thank you. Public comment on a flexible agenda. Okay. No, just for the flexible agenda. Okay. All right. The board, no public comment. There's nothing online. Okay. The board's going to vote. All in favor of a flexible agenda, say aye. 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 Unanimous pass. Okay. We're on consent items for possible action. Would someone like to make a motion to approve the consent? I'll make a motion that we approve the consent. I'll second that motion. Thank you. Any public comment? Okay. All in favor of approving the consent items, say aye. 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 Unanimous pass. Word number three, introduction and special recognition uh, Mr. Walling. If it's okay, I'm going to stand. I'd like to bring Ms. Doris Betts to the front and Ms. Rami Cronin Mack to the front. And Ms. Edna Ross. And Ms. Edna, Edna Ross. Edna Ross. Where are the recipients? Oh, yeah. Is Kelly here? There's Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent Lewis, Madam Chair, I want to say how much I appreciate the fact that you have made the time on the agenda for us to make this recognition from, for two of our outstanding teachers that are here in the Douglas County School District. Can you eat that? <laughs> I could learn to hate you. <laughs> I am Doris Betts and I have made this presentation several years and it really is a delight. It's quite an honor because we had the process in the district, uh, which Mr. Walling has been this time, this year. It's the first year he's done a great job. But we had the process where anybody in the district can submit an application to be recognized for the Greg Betts Scholarship. And that can be a certified person, which would be a teacher or an administrator or it can be a classified person, which we think of as the secretaries, the backbone of the school, the custodials, the people that work in the cafeteria, those that drive the buses, those that do any maintenance, landscaping, whatever. If you're classified, you're eligible 
to submit a letter, one page, please, and tell us what your skills are that you're using today and how you would like to improve them. And so we welcome those applications. They come in the spring, and then we do the presentation before school starts in the fall. This year, we have two recipients. Quite often, we only have one, but we have two. And that is because an assistant superintendent of personnel that worked with Greg passed away this year. And so in memory of George, we have a second recipient this year. The, the two recipients, and I just met Kelly, so this is unfair to Kelly, but I did talk to Lindsay and say, would you like to tell everybody a little bit about yourself so they can get to know you? Uh, <laughs> she's still talking to me. So <laughs> the other thing that she had to do was I said, you know, I'm, I have a habit of forgetting names. So if I forget your name, kind of whisper to me. And so she will. Okay, Lindsay. Hi, so closer. Can you hear me? Okay, I'll squat down a little bit. Um, so I've been in the district for 11 years. I'll give you a little brief history. I taught kindergarten for most of those years and I just moved to the professional development office. I work as a professional learning specialist. So I help all of our new teachers with their curriculum and instruction, um, teachers throughout the district. And so uh, I'm very appreciative of this award to further my knowledge uh, with my master's program in leadership. And I look forward to using what I learned through my master's program to help all the teachers in our district to grow and become even better at what they're already doing. So thank you. <laughs> all right, Kelly. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Kelly. I've been in the district for about six years working as a paraeducator in um, the special education realm. Um, I am now have accepted a paid internship position actually to teach because um, I will be getting my license at the end of this next year. Um, so I very much appreciate um, this award. I'm looking forward to working in this district and supporting more kids now. So one of the recipients this year is going for her bachelor's so she can be a teacher in the classroom. The other one is going for her master's so that she can learn more skills so she can teach other people more skills. Uh, and believe it or not, she was a kindergarten teacher where in kindergarten is where you learn everything. Oh now she's teaching the adults. <laughs> so that's good. Uh, one year we did have, uh, and I forgot to mention in the uh, scholarship, um, if you applied for the award this year and did not get it, you still can apply again next year. That doesn't rule you out at all. The other is if you applied this year or last year and you got it and you've met your current goals for that scholarship, you can apply again. And we did. We had one person who applied several times in the district and had her doctorate. I don't know, but I think she's still in the district. But anyway, it's, it's a scholarship that we really enjoy giving and the two recipients here certainly enjoyed receiving it. But, <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Doris. Thank you, Edna. Thank you, Rami. Uh, we appreciate your support of our employees and uh, your loved ones and their memory. Uh, remains in our district. Uh, obviously many of us came in uh, when they were uh, still working for Douglas County. So I have a couple uh, introductions tonight. Uh, you have previously approved these hires, but we haven't officially uh, recognized them in a board meeting. So I would like uh, Dr. Marcy Guthrie to stand up wherever you are. So Dr. Guthrie has been hired as the principal of Gardnerville Elementary School. She joins DCSD after most recently serving as the superintendent of the Chawanaki, Chawanaki, I butched that, uh, Unified School District, which is a small district east of the Fresno area. Uh, during her career, Marcy also served as a superintendent in the Motherlode Unified School District as an assistant superintendent uh, of curriculum and instruction in the Keens Canyon Joint Unified School District 
and most importantly as an elementary school principal in the Clovis Unified and Hanford Elementary School districts. She earned her bachelor's degree from San Diego State University and her master's in educational leadership from Fresno Pacific University. Ms. Guthrie was the 2021 Association of California School Administrators Region 2 Superintendent of the Year. She and her husband, Alan, are looking forward to uh, relocating to Douglas County on a permanent basis as they have owned a residence in the Zephyr Cove area for many years. So welcome, uh, Dr. Marcy Guthrie. And our most recent hire, uh, Veronica Griffith, I think sitting right next close to her. So Veronica has been hired as the assistant principal of Jack's Valley Elementary School. Uh, Ms. Griffith has served as an ESL teacher for the last 10 years here in DCSD, um, often splitting three schools, which is a schedule no one likes, uh, but she did it masterfully. And she has been an active member of our aspiring administrators group. Prior to coming to DCSD, Veronica taught for eight years in the Carson City School District and the Adelanto School District. Lifelong learning is without question a priority for Ms. Griffith as she holds a master's degree in curriculum instruction from Chapman University and another master's degree in educational leadership from the American College of Education. Veronica and her husband, Chris, who was uh, raised here and is a Douglas High School graduate, um, have three children attending Douglas County Schools. Congratulations, Veronica. And that's what we got. Trustee uh, Dickerson, do you have an ASB report? I don't, thank you. There was nothing sent to me. Okay. Correspondence? Okay. Board reports? Trustee Kangas? Uh, I have none. I have a short one. Um, I did attend uh, the Board of Directors for the Chamber of Commerce. Um, on August 5th, and just a couple of things that uh, that was talked about by the by Commissioner Mark Gardner was talking about the Douglas County is going to be working on their strategic plan, the five to ten year plan. Um, let's see what else. Uh, something else that came up was uh, Jen Nalder taught. She's the head of Main Street, and she talked about um, the improvements that they're doing, and they do offer um, grants out there that they will match if you put, it's a, it's a facade improvement. And let's see, they did some lighting at the Historian Inn and on the balcony is something else they're working on. Uh, Wildflower had some new signs uh, coming up are the Slaughterhouse Coffin Races. And then also on August 10th, uh, there's a ice cream social that's going to be at, on the patio at DST Coffee. Um, also that was mentioned um, is there's going to be a new uh, pack formed. Uh, Sharla Hales is, in, is working on this and Brian Davis will be the chair of this. So if anyone's interested, um, you can get a hold of them. And I think that's it. Thank you. Nothing to report. I have nothing. Trustee Dickerson. I don't have anything, thank you. I have nothing to report this time. And I don't either. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to move to correspondence. Start with Trustee Kangas. Um, <clears throat> I received a lot of correspondence since our last meeting. Uh, I recognize the 60 emails that I'd uh, received prior to the uh, meeting and I got about 55 more. And uh, it was all along the same lines that uh, I want to recognize them because they took the time to, uh, to uh, send it to us. And uh, they, do not want, they did not want to terminate the RFP. Uh, they did not want to fire Mop and Cox and Legoy as our legal counsel. They did not want to hire Mr. Gilbert. And they were concerned about the extra cost of hiring Mr. Gilbert. And they were very concerned about the transparency of this board. Um, one other correspondence I received was um, um, a resignation letter of our HR director, Joe Gardner, and uh, very concerning content. Thank you. 
Trustee Gilson. I'm not going to repeat what Trustee Kangas said because I'm pretty sure we all got the same uh, letters, correspondence. Um, I received many, many, many correspondence about the same issues that Trustee Kangas brought up with the hiring of uh, Mr. Gilbert and the firing of our uh, legal team that we had for over 20 years. Um, I also received, as did everyone on the board, receive a letter from Joe Gerdner, and it was titled Constructive Discharge. And if you're not sure what that means, you can look it up, or I could tell you, I guess, it's he's felt that he was being forced out. Um, but that's his story. Um, what other? Oh, I also, something I would like to note, because this came up quite a few times in my correspondence, is the concern of our community members and the board being on their phones during the meetings. Many people asked if we could just please put our phones away and look up and pay attention. And that was a theme that I received as well. Other than that, it was the same as Trustee Kangas. Thank you. Trustee Engelkirk. Um, I received uh, comments about the changing legal counsel, both pro and con. And in addition to that, um, I received correspondence from some Zephyr Cove or, or Lake residents concerned about what we can do about the lake schools and improve um, attendance. So. Trustee Burns. Yeah, I've received a couple of correspondence. Uh, uh, one was uh, in particular, well, more than a couple, but a couple that was addressing different issues than what we've had. And one of them was, is what are we going to do as a board? Uh, what are we going to do about uh, the um, uh, testing scores and, uh, and where we set as a state one as where we set in a county uh, in the United States about how our students are doing? So um, uh, great concerns. I can, that's the way that parents came across to me. The other thing with uh, telephone, if you see me dealing with my phone, it's my timer. That's it. Thank you. Trustee Magnata. I just want to report uh, um, Joe's reg resignation, which was very disturbing and uh, some of the comments that he made in his resignation letter, I think, uh, you know, verges on some criminal issues. So I turn that letter over to the uh, sheriff. Trustee Dickerson. Yes, I got a couple of uh, correspondence pro and con concerning uh, Joey and um, also the Zephyr Cove schools and what we can do uh, in regard to um, improving their attendance and making them successful. Thank you. I, I also received correspondence on both sides, a lot of support and a lot of people who were not in support. The, I'll read the good news. I'd like to, I'd like to add something to correspondence. Okay. Um, it's nice when we all get the same correspondence because we all are one board. And whenever anyone sends me something that's they write me a letter for or against or whatever it is, or whether it's about uh, the buses or anything, it would be nice if we are all copied on that. Because um, I can tell you that I know what you're receiving and you know what I'm receiving because our names are on it. But when we're talking that you're getting letters for and against, I think I would like to know, I would like to have that sent, if you don't mind, if we could just be one board and have everything sent to all of us. That would be very helpful and it would help us in communicating with each other on uh, these issues that we're talking about. Thank you. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Trust you, Burns open meeting law violation. You cannot go beyond three board members. Not when a person's writing to us. We have received, I know for a fact, Dave, that's not true. If we forward it, 
It's an open meeting law violation. You can no, I'm not asking you to forward. I'm asking you to politely ask the person that sends you a correspondence if and I've done this probably 50 times last month, ask them if they could please copy the entire board, the person who's writing the letter, to ask them to please send it to all the board members so that we're all on the same page. So I know it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. I want to start out by saying that our summer school report was excellent and there was a great paint job at the old playhouse at CVMS and we're looking forward to a great school year and a great football season. Superintendent Lewis, your report. She doesn't like it, it's short. That's what happens when you're three weeks between meetings. So uh, tonight, uh, you approve the hiring of Michael Roth um, as the new Director of Informational uh, Technology. Uh, Mr. Roth uh, made the very long trek in his vehicle from Alaska over the last weekend and arrived uh, here in Douglas County on Sunday and reported work on uh, Monday. Uh, I think he's going to like the uh, structure of our school district where he doesn't have to fly uh, to every school uh, that he's uh, servicing. So uh, we're excited. Uh, he comes to us, uh, as I said, um, after serving as assistant director and director of information technology from the lower Yukon School District in Mountain Village, Alaska. Uh, prior to that, he served as the director of technology with the uh, Cuspook uh, School District, which, uh, which is also in Alaska, and as an IT manager at Miami-Dade College. So he's lived in uh, uh, both realms of the world, to say the least. And he has uh, quickly been thrown into the fire uh, with some uh, network switches and uh, the havoc that can create with our uh, systems and so they've been uh, uh, working hard uh, just in the last two days. So we would uh, like to welcome uh, Mr. Roth. He'll be here next month and I'll introduce him to you. Uh, but he's getting his feet wet uh, and didn't have time today. So um, we held our annual leadership forum last week here in Minden uh, with our site and district administrators. Um, our theme for the forum was be your own real life superhero. So if uh, anyone happened to see adults walking around in uh, superhero mask in downtown Minden, uh, that was my group. Um, doing a fun scavenger hunt and uh, just having some levity. Um, we challenged our district administrators to discover how to use their own everyday superpowers uh, to be extraordinary in life and work. Um, I would like to thank Shannon, Leslie, Cheryl, Jeannie, and Mark, um, my staff that does an excellent job of putting together uh, the trainings and the, the three days of uh, PD that we provide. And uh, it, we've gotten good reports back from our administrators. So it was three great days of learning fun and uh, camaraderie. So, and then uh, just as we prepare um, before we meet again, we will have school going. Um, so the district's new certified employees will report uh, for the 2023-24 school year this Thursday um, for four days of pre-service training. Uh, the district certified inclusive education staff uh, will report a week from today. And then the rest of our DCSD certified staff will report to work on Wednesday, August 16th. Uh, the first day for school in DCSD, both here in the uh, valley and up at the lake, is Monday, um, August 21st. So uh, we're the buzz will start here real quick of getting ready for uh, the school year. So that's my report. Thank you. First reading of board policy 334. Oh, summer school report, Shannon Brown. As you said, first of all, we'd like to feel it was very successful. I wanted to thank up front um, Amy Carter and Molly Ravenscroft, both VPs in the district, for stepping up and being our summer school administrators. And then the administrative assistant in my office, Lisa Vincent, uh, between the three of them and counselors, they put it all together and did 95% of the work. So summer school is in person at CVMS. It ran from June 26th to July 30th, Monday through Thursdays from 8 to noon or 8 to 1230. And then teachers signed up to provide tutoring if students wanted to stay longer each day to get more work done. Um, the summer school utilizes Edgenuity. It's our online curriculum. And then they have a certified teacher in that area to support 
the kids that are the students that are taking the class, whether it's English, we paired them up with English teachers. And uh, there were 34 different semester courses were taught. Um, we had 19 teachers, one counselor, an administrator, one secretary, one special education teacher, a behavior specialist, and this year again we had a social worker and a social work intern. Um, we added some information to this report from last year based on questions that the board had after we gave the report. So um, one of the questions last year was how many students were invited and that was 445 from our secondary schools. Of that 247 registered, um, 56 of them did not complete that. The typical reasons were either behavior for um, attendance or lack of progress. Their parents signed them up, but they came in and they weren't, as much as we tried to get them to make progress, they weren't making progress. But we had 191 students complete to recover 199 credits. And then it broke down there below just the subject matter that each of those credits are in. So do you have any questions? Thank you. Any questions? That sounds really great, Shannon. Thank you. Very successful summer. Yes. Board number 10, first reading of board policy 334, unpaid family and medical leave. Superintendent Lewis. All right, thank you, President Jansen. So our next two items are related and obviously I'll take them one at a time, but uh, um, as I've mentioned and uh, Mr. Gerdner has mentioned previously, uh, we went through an audit of our HR policies with Pool Pack, and they made recommendations uh, going through our policies of where we needed to um, make sure that we were addressing certain issues. And so uh, before you tonight is board policy 334, unpaid family and medical leave. Uh, the base, the real big ad addition to this is really just making sure that uh, uh, military leave is covered uh, through the FMLA. Um, and we were obviously providing that, but we had not documented. So this brings our policy um, up to uh, what the federal standard is for the uh, un family, unpaid family and medical leave. Um, and so as, as we um, do these, obviously the blue is additions and any, uh, this doesn't have any strike through, but red would be our strike through. So I'm open for any questions. Do you want to just go into how that's replacing? The well, I'll do that next. So let's go ahead and, and then I'll piggyback perfect. on that. Yeah, perfect. I'm prepared to make a motion. Yeah. Oh. I just had a question um, The in loco parentis is a relationship in which a parent has assumed the obligations of a parent to a child with whom the person has no legal or biological connection including day-to-day -day responsibilities. Is this like somebody's called to duty, they need to pick somebody to, to, to handle their child. And, and so that's what that's could about, be, just in an emergency yeah. situation. And I'm gonna actually defer out here into the crowd, Leanne, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but have you had that situation? What? Yeah, if you'd come up real quick. Leanne just deals with this intimately um, Thank and you. as our uh, risk coordinator. So, sorry, Perfect. Leanne. No, I'm. I just wanted. To, I didn't no, know. I, I'd never heard of that before. Okay. You just never know when you're around me if you're going to get <laughs> called on the spot. Oops. There, there go. you go. Leanne Karras, for the record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in loco parentis would be if a parent was caring for uh, the, the child of a deployed uh, individual. So a parent is caring for, or just anybody that they do in an emergency deem as a parent to be as a parent. Thank you. Could be someone in relation okay. an aunt, uncle. Thank you, Leanne. In case they had to care for that parent. Thank or you, that Lee. child. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. You might if they have any more questions. Okay. It's just something I've never heard of. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Okay. Someone may, someone. Yeah. Carrie has a motion on the floor. Um, I make a motion that the board approve board policy 334 on paid family and medical leave as a first reading. Thank you. Uh, 
public comment? Would you like to comment? Trustee Burns? I agree. I just like legal counsel to review it between now and next meeting. That's all. Just to review it. Keeps us out of trouble down the road. That's all I'm saying. If I can add our policy mirrors the federal policy. He says no problem. Okay, are we ready to take a vote? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. You're off the spot. Thank you. <laughs> Number 11, first reading, revocation of board policy 428, Superintendent Lewis. So with your uh, past action, uh, we have some redundancy in some of our policies going uh, way back in the day. We had certified policies and we had classified policies and we had FMLA policies in both. And so um, what you have passed as a first reading in, for 334 um, will apply to all of our employees. And so it makes board policy 428 redundant. And so therefore we're recommending that we revoke that policy um, since we no longer need it. And so again, the red strike through, you can see the entire policy is uh, struck through because it will go away um, upon approval. Okay, any comments from the board? Okay. Trustee Inkelkirk, would okay. you like to make yeah, a motion? Making a motion that we approve the revocation of board policy 428 unpaid family and medical leave as a first read at, should that be as a first reading? Yeah. Okay, as a first reading. Okay, any public comment? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, number 12, second, second reading of board policy 108. So I, uh, President Jansen and I agreed to pull this one out. It's uh, before you tonight as a second reading, but because there was discussion um, during our last meeting, I wanted to pull it out to make sure that we had uh, uh, discussed the concerns. Um, I'll move to uh, direct your attention to the back. Um, public comment uh, had made a, a great point that in number five, the inclusion of alcohol made it seem like an employee could not uh, distribute drink uh, at any time or in any amount. Um, so what I am suggesting is that we strike that in number five. Um, as you look throughout this uh, policy, um, we do a good job of addressing uh, alcohol possession, distribution, use on school grounds. So we don't need it in number five. Um, and I think it's uh, very clear that we're an alcohol free uh, environment the way it's worded without that. So. And then um, the other uh, discussion was around the pr uh, prohibited substance, including medical and recreational mar marijuana. Again, being uh, receiving federal funds and the fact that marijuana is not federally uh, a, an approved drug, um, we, are, we have to prohibit the use of uh, marijuana, um, both recreational or medical. Um, and so this policy reflect, reflects federal uh, law for us. So those, it's up for your discussion. Any, any comments? Okay, would somebody like to make a motion? Please. I'll make a motion. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I will make a motion that the board approve the second reading of the revision of board policy 108, controlled substance and alcohol free environment with uh, the caveat that we strike item five from the. No, it's uh, it's struck already, Carrie. You don't, okay. so you, as, as, as presented tonight okay. would be your. All right, so you want me to start over then? I, um, 
Make a motion that the board approve the second reading of the revision of board policy 108, controlled substance and alcohol free environment. Thank you, do I have a second? Trustee Magnata made a second. P public comment? Okay, let's take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed unanimously. Uh, agenda number 13, designation of position of critical shortage needed. Superintendent Lewis. So, um, as you know, we've brought uh, many positions before you for uh, consideration of critical shortage. Uh, what this means is that we could hire someone who is currently collecting Nevada PERS um, into a uh, certified position and um, hire them as a teacher. Uh, when we do this, uh, Nevada PERS approves it for a two-year period, and so then we um, uh, then have to renew it. And so what's before you tonight is a renewal um, for elementary classroom uh, teacher. Uh, right now, I think we have, uh, we still obviously have some movement uh, going on. I think we have one elementary position opening uh, right now that we are uh, struggling to fill at uh, Scarcelli. Um, so this obviously would assist us in our hiring efforts. Um, and so, and then the other, the question that's come up to me uh, several times is even though this is a two year approval with Nevada PERS, we still only commit to a one year contract with the employee. And, and our obligation is to continually um, look to find someone who is not retired uh, to fill those positions. And so if you look at our job board, often you'll see a position uh, regular and then followed with a critical shortage to give us the flexibility to go either way. But our administrators obviously know um, that they're we, we want to hire a qualified uh, person that's not retired first, but obviously we all know the teacher shortage and, um, and especially in the world of special ed, uh, this has been critical um, to our staffing needs. So um, I ask you to approve this uh, so that we can get it approved for another two year period. Trustee Burns. Yeah, I, we had a discussion. Uh, the only thing I'd like to see is every year um, an evaluation report just f more for information than anything but if then at that point we needed to bring up something we could that's the only thing i'd see to change on that yep and if just to ensure we're on the same page we talked about a table that you could just see what the board has approved where we are in the cycle of when it was approved when it would be renewed is that so you're you have that visual? Yeah, year. in in a personal um, your personal evaluation of it as well. Oh. Your report. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just want clarification. Um, I Keith or, or Dave, either one. Are you talking about that we get at the end of each year uh, of all the critical shortage positions? Is that what you're talking about, the valuation? I'm, I'm not clear on what we're evaluating. The person that's in the position or the position or, I'm not sure. I, I I'll let Trustee Burns speak to that. Yeah, I think of evaluation of what is happening and what's going on, uh, just so we know what's going on. Uh, you know, if it, but not to know, well, you can make it in a report. I'm sure you yeah. already have it on and just give us a report of what's open you do that anyway, but every year to evaluate this particular program coming from a uh, superintendent. Okay, I'm still, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a little dense here tonight. So I, and when would you want this report? That's what, first of all, when would you want the report? Do you want it every month? Do you want it at the end of the, every school year? I think, I, I what, think what it's an ongoing talking tracker. Okay, in, in not some each ways, month? it's a tracker that we are. Okay, th that, that sounds because good. Because you, you have had a lot of these come before you. Sure. And you probably don't know everyone that you've approved or what we have okay. approved here in the district. So okay. again, I think it's kind of an ongoing tracker. Mm -hmm. When did we approve it? When is it Got renewed? It. Did we Got renew it? And then again, um, how many, I could see it even, you know, how many people are hired in that. So this elementary critical shortage, we hired two um, in this school year. So you're kind of get an idea of what. So all critical shortage. Yes. What we're putting it in a report. That's, yes. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Thank you. 
Trustee Dickerson. I just wanted to say for the record, I, it's kind of unfortunate that, and I understand that retired teachers don't fill the coffers and that's kind of a financial thing with PERS, but it just seems like a wealth of options to fill positions that we desperately need. That's just unfortunate to me that you know money takes precedence over children, but I guess that's just the way it is. I mean, isn't that the reason they don't want retired teachers is because they're not putting money in the coffers is that it, to fund PERS? Why would no. they not want retired teachers? Well, I, I think they've been, I think that's what this allows us to do. Um, because typically if you're retired, you but, then you have a cap. So if I, if I retire and then I want to go out and substitute teach, mm -hmm. I have a cap of what I can make. Right. Which wouldn't, I would not be able to go be a teacher because I would go past that cap. So this actually gives us the flexibility to address the teacher shortage by bringing people back. And then there's incentive for retirees to come back because financially. Yeah. I noticed though that it said if PERS says it's okay. Yeah. And so I and mean, we I haven't had one declined yet, but you have oh. to, but we can't come here and, you know, let's just say, it's hard to pick a job now that is feels easy. Um, but let's just say PE teacher, that's what I used to be. And we had all kinds of applicants. Then we couldn't make an argument to go to PERS and say we need critical shortage. So it's really about, we have to show that despite all of our efforts, we're still struggling to be able to fill those positions. Yeah, And I that's why I think the renewal comes up is that it's not just a blanket forever when they approve yeah. it, that you have to continue to show that need. Right. I just remember this coming before the previous board, and that was the, if PERS says it's okay, yeah. and here we're just desperate, you know. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Trustee Burns. Yeah, she is right um, about the PERS does not want teachers to go retire and then turn right around and go back into full time or even, but that's the reason why PERS has it that way. Yes. But they are giving across the nation, I guess, everybody is short. And I, and I, you know, I do think it is uh, somewhat unique to uh, Nevada that PERS, I don't know that every state allows their retired teachers and yeah. it's probably somewhere where they're going to go because <laughs> uh, they're going to have to. So, and again, I would tell you, you know, I think we have, Cheryl can correct me if I'm wrong, I think we have four or five of our special ed teachers district-wide that are critical shortage. Um, and we probably employ, uh, I would say probably around five additional teachers in uh, across the board. So probably about 10 um, would be around where our number is. Yep. I, I think we're fortunate because I think we're getting retired teachers out of California, which does not fall under the purse. Right. I know because my wife did it. Yeah. So, but they wouldn't fall under, we wouldn't hire them under critical shortage. So only people in critical shortage are Nevada retirees. I can make a motion if you'd like. That would be great. Okay. I'd like to recommend that the board approve the request position of elementary classroom teacher is a position for critical shortage need. Second. Okay. Public comment. For the record, May Hyatt. <clears throat> um, just to bring awareness to you and everyone else in the room, um, I looked online today. There are 72 open positions within the district, 72, not just teachers. So if by definition we're talking about critical shortage, it's everywhere. Um, there are 24 positions open, not only for elementary school, but middle school and high school, um, all across the board. There are 24 positions open for student support services, 13 of which are special education aides. Um, also to bring to your attention and the attention of everyone else listening, Carson City School Board just approved a salary increase of $7,000 for their staff. And I also wanna to bring to your attention, what are we going to do as a county, as a district 
to entice staff teachers to come here when Carson City is just up the road? What are we gonna do to make sure that Douglas County gets the very best? I have two kids that come to Douglas County schools and my son is gonna be a junior at Douglas High School. His freshman year for math, he had a revolving door of substitute teachers for math. And that's one of the most important subjects that he needs to learn. And he had nothing but substitute teachers. My daughter is about to start at Carson Valley Middle School and there is a critical shortage. You may not call it a critical shortage, but there is a shortage of middle school teachers as well. And I want you to acknowledge that, not just for elementary, but for middle school and high school as well. And I also want to bring and acknowledge the dire need for special education aids. Those children and those families need that support as well. In addition to that, we're looking at seven support staff. We need bus drivers, we need cashiers, we need mechanics, we need custodians, we need substitute teachers. Not only substitute teachers, but we need substitutes for special ed and the school nutrition program. We need playground aides. And it's not about recruiting retirees. They retired for a reason. They don't want to work anymore. So enticing retirees to come back doesn't make any sense. And for you to tell me, well, you know what? Shame on these people for wanting more money. I'm sorry. Tell you what. I have a master's degree in education. I am a teacher with over 20 years of experience teaching high school science. And guess what? I don't work at Douglas High. I don't work at Carson High. You know why? They don't pay me enough. They don't pay me enough to deal with what I would have to deal with at the high school level. You want me to go back to work? Pay me more. Pay me more. Pay our teachers more, pay our staff more, because we deserve it. If you don't know what it's like to be a teacher or a staff member, walk in their shoes, be a substitute. Thank you very much. Thank you. So just, we don't normally respond, but I, we are going to be entering in negotiations with all of our employee groups. So um, the fact that we have not announced a uh, agreement does not mean that we are not going to be working towards that and working towards uh, being competitive with our surrounding districts. So I do want to state for the record that uh, we will be engaging in negotiations and we plan to uh, be competitive. Uh, and also, um, obviously, I have assumed uh, some HR duties as well, um, and I am signing uh, hirings left and right uh, every time I go out to my basket. Um, so our administrators are just coming back um, from their summer break and are interviewing. And and again, I, Ms. Hyatt has a great point. We, I, we have openings. Um, but all districts probably have a lot of openings right now. And so we're, we're working hard to fill those. And I want to assure the public that we are. Can I? And I, I just need to make a quick thing. We personally don't hire staff. It's important to understand that. I, I agree with her 100%. But uh, so let's, not, let's not engage. Mr. Lewis, can you touch? I mean, there's reason sometimes, but no excuses, of course. Uh, but there is a reason. I mean, things change in the state of the finances to this board, to this school district, which used to get one of the highest because we have the largest revenue. But uh, we're not having that. Do you want to go a little well, it's, further? I mean, funding is always based on enrollment. And I, it's no secret Douglas County's enrollment is not increasing. Um, and I can give you um, right now, as we look at our numbers right now, we have a senior class of about 200 more than our kindergarten class. And that's become a pattern over the last three to four years. And so you're seeing that's a huge difference. If you're graduating uh, 400 and some kids and your kindergarten class is 220, you, you're going to see uh, the decline that we see. And, and uh, property values in this county are high. 
we all know that young families struggle uh, to come here. We know that our teachers uh, and all of our employees um, struggle on a one income to live in this valley. And so those are all factors. Um, and you know the pupil center funding uh, model takes Douglas County taxes and they don't return all those taxes back to us. Um, and that's how the model works. Uh, the model is weighted towards uh, EL students at what they uh, uh, define as at-risk students and GT students. Um, we don't have a ton of diversity uh, in Douglas County. And so our funding on those weighted categories, uh, we fall under. And uh, finally, uh, there's no uh, allowance in the pupil-centered funding uh, plan for uh, cost of living. So we don't get any recognition that Douglas County uh, is high cost of living. With that being said, obviously, uh, Governor Lombardo uh, and the legislature put an influx of money into uh, education and we will benefit from that. Um, but I think we have to be careful because they project our enrollment and they fund us. And so our first quarter payment may be higher than what we end up seeing as, as our num true numbers come in they make that adjustment. So they don't just say, here's your uh, enrollment and here's all the money you get for the year. That is a day by day looking at enrollment and then quarterly they pay that out and make adjustments. So as an example, last year when we got our uh, projected number, we ended up getting about 1.9 million less in funding based on our what our actual enrollment was. Um, again, I'm not gonna, I can't talk about negotiations in public um, but I can assure you that uh, the board has uh, given me um, authority, uh, the parameters of which to move forward. And uh, we've already started having conversations with our meet and confer groups, and we are getting ready to start um, with our uh, recognized associations and unions, and um, we value our employees. And I think that uh, to your credit, last year was a year that uh, we were not obligated to negotiate, but we found three and a half percent to give to our employees. And it, is it ever enough? No. But I think as the time I've been in superintendent, um, I think I and our boards have always shown that if we have the ability, we will do it. And I think moving forward, um, I feel uh, confident. I'd love, you know, I'd love to give more. But again, I think we can uh, be competitive. But I do, for the record, and I've said this, I am worried long term for Douglas County. Um, we are, you know, we uh, are going to compete with Carson and Lyon uh, primarily, and they are going to be in a different financial situation long term in the pupil centered funding if things don't change with how that is allocated. So um, the other thing I do want to address on that issue is uh, there's uh, SB 231. Uh, people are hearing about that. That was an additional $250 million. Um, unfortunately, it's a one time uh, funding source. And so uh, it is to be used for salaries um, for uh, all uh, support staff employees and teachers. Um, administrators uh, are not eligible for that money. Um, and so uh, it will be matching. We're still waiting for guidance of how much will be allocated to Douglas County. Um, but one of the, you know, one of the, it, it's great for in the short term, but it's terrible when they give you money that isn't, that's considered soft money is gonna go away. And so what do we do two years from now we've had this influx of money that, that we know, right? Well, I shouldn't, at this point we know there is not money behind it to sustain it. And so those will be conversations again that we have with our employee groups uh, when we get more guidance on that matter, so, okay. I'd like to make a comment on that. Um, you know, we were able to spend our own tax dollars as far as education you know, because we got the lake and the real estate taxes and the money that's dedicated to our schools comes from those real estate taxes. Well, what they did is they said, oh, they passed a thing saying that we can put all the money together now. We don't get our money. We have to divide it equally amongst the whole state. So that means we're a big loser. And in two years, we're going to have a huge budget shortfall, I believe. So thank you. Yeah, just make sure everybody understands $250 million is not ours. <laughs> oh, that's a good, good point. Typically about 1.2% of that is ours. That's our, uh, uh, that's Douglas County's enrollment in the state is about 1.2% uh, of the total enrollment. 
Any other comments from the board? Pub any other public comment? Okay, let's take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. We're going to start public comment. Please sign up if you're going to speak. And when you come up, please state your name clearly. You guys could line up too, if you'd like. Two and a half minutes, single bell. At the bell is, the bell is at uh, two minutes. Oh, it's three minutes. The bell's at two and a half. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Tracy Moultrup and I am starting my 23rd year at Jacks Valley Elementary. Um, Ms. Hyde and Superintendent Lewis already spoke to some of this, but I do have some that I would like to add as a teacher here today. So last month, our neighboring school district, Carson City, their school board unanimously voted to increase the starting annual salary for Carson City teachers from 42,000 to 52,000. Carson City now has the highest starting salary for teachers in Northern Nevada. Yay for them, well deserved. The board also voted for pay increases of $7,000 per year for all educators and a 14% increase for all education support professionals. And here we sit in Douglas County, what used to be called the lighthouse district of the state with starting teacher salaries still at $43,000. Based on 2022 salary data reported by the Nevada Department of Education, Douglas County ranks 14th out of 17 counties when it comes to base maximum salary. That's pathetic, 14th out of 17 in base maximum salary. With Carson City's recent bump in pay, this former lighthouse district that I work for will be the 15th in lowest pay, maximum pay for educators. Yet look at our cost of living that was addressed earlier. We will not retain our current teachers or attract new quality teachers if something does not change. Our students and their academic achievement will suffer. I've not heard any mention of student achievement by this board at all. As a well-respected veteran teacher, I find it truly disgusting that this small group of individuals, the majority of this board, not all, but the majority, is putting more money into Joey Gilbert's pocket to further their extremist political agenda, and that is exactly what it is, rather than focusing on student achievement and retaining and attracting quality teachers. When we're running for your positions, the newly elected board members, you claim that taking care of teachers was a priority. When do you plan on following through with this? Instead, you're paying 50% more monthly to hire an attorney who is taking classes in education law. It's disgusting. This is absurd. This is absurd. And those of you who voted for this should be embarrassed and ashamed of yourselves. 
Your extremist views and actions are taking away critical district funds needed for students and Thank staff. Thank you, Ms. Meltra. And you're putting our children's education at risk. Dave C. David Seat for the record. The new seating arrangement is duly noted. The Declaration of Independence includes a specific set of rights defined as unalienable, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are rights that no matter what happens may never be taken away from an individual. I will focus on the unalienable right of liberty. The God-given First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States that is part of the Bill of Rights states in part that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. In 1868, the 14th Amendment was added to the US Constitution and it prohibited states from denying people liberty without due process. From the 1920s to the 40s, the Supreme Court applied all of the clauses of the First Amendment to the states. Thus, the First Amendment now covers actions by federal, state and local governments the First Amendment also applies to all branches of government, including legislators, courts, juries, and executive officials and agencies. This includes public employers, public university systems, and public school systems. In a landmark 1964 Supreme Court decision, New York Times versus Sullivan, concerning First Amendment freedom of, freedom of speech, Supreme Court Justice William Brennan wrote, quote, against the background of a profound national commitment to the principle that debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, and that it may well include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. During last month's public comment, I was interrupted on multiple occasions. The justification given by the fired legal counsel for the interruptions was based on the Nevada Open Meeting Law, Part 5.09. This section of the Open Meeting Law that requires a 30-day written notice to address issues of public concern regarding individuals elected or employed by the district clearly impedes and restricts an individual's First Amendment rights and is unconstitutional on its face. I stand by every word of my public comment stated last month. As a Douglas County resident and taxpayer, I am calling for a thorough, independent, third party investigation and audit to determine how a person, Michael Ishmari, who has a 25 year criminal record dating back to 1998 regarding stalking and disregarding restraining orders was allowed to become a Douglas County school district teacher. This audit must include all action and inaction of all personnel, including Superintendent Keith Lewis and be made publicly available at its conclusion. Accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Golightly. Good afternoon. Do I need to turn it on? There we go. Good afternoon. First of all, I want to thank this current board for hanging in there and doing the job when you're being attacked from all sides. I want to thank you tremendously for hiring Mr. Gilbert's firm. I'm the child of two teachers. That'll explain some of this to those teachers in the background. You guys, we're supposed to teach reading, writing, arithmetic, history. We're not supposed to do anything else here. And it is not this board's fault that teachers are not paid what they darn well deserve to be paid. Thank you, no thank you. When I got my degree in California, I was able to take the CBEST and be a substitute teacher. I lasted two days and went out there and said, I'm going to be a successful real estate agent because there is no way I am doing this. My mom laughed for days. Okay. So you guys, 
none of this is easy. It wasn't easy on the previous board. It isn't easy on this one. And I want you to know that you are all doing the right things. And I know that I believe what um, board member Burns was trying to say was what Tony just said. They put all of the funds in this big thing and it doesn't matter how much of our real estate taxes or any other taxes go into that pool. They determine what we get and what we don't. And thank you, Superintendent Lewis for saying, you know, they're gonna give us this money, not all of it, but they're gonna give us this money, but it's a one shot deal. So if we put all of that into employee salaries, then we're short the next year, the next year, and the next year if that money doesn't come. So I'm thankful that you guys are willing to be uncomfortable and go through hate mail. And I'm really glad, Trustee Burns, that you explained that no, if we did what it appeared Linda was suggesting, that it would put you guys in an open law problem trap, no trap, who knows. But thank you for clarifying that you can't do that. Thank you. Mrs. McGuffin. Sherry McGuffin. President Jansen, I'm Sherry McGuffin. We have never met. We have been linked to one another for the past month because of the profane words you directed towards my son and me. The attack was unwarranted, inappropriate, and completely unbecoming of someone who holds a public office. I am asking you for a public apology for calling me a piece of shit at the last meeting. Mrs. McGuffin, I sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, apologize to you. Well, I appreciate your apology. I know it's very difficult to admit when you were in the wrong. I am here today because I believe in accountability. I am here to ask the other six board members to place an item on your next meeting's agenda. Specifically, I would like the board to discuss whether President Jansen should be censured for her conduct during the last meeting. Not just her inappropriate comments towards me, but the disrespectful comments and attitude she directed towards Trustee Gilkerson, Trustee Magnata, and other members of the public. President Jansen, you are an elected official. Even more, you are president of a school board. Your behavior should be a model for the students in this school district. Students like my grandchildren who are here today. I know you haven't lived here very long and I know your kids didn't attend our schools, but we are good people. And we expect our kids and our grandkids to be good people. And it is our responsibility as adults to show them what that looks like. Again, thank you for your apology. Debbie Silva. Um, I also wanted to speak to the same subject, and um, I know it's been said, I think, in some of the newspaper writings that um, you had a hard day, um, it was long hours, etc. But I think that's kind of beside the point. Um, what's really important to understand is not only was that uh, an attack, a verbal attack on the MacGuffins, um, it also cause two people who were in the audience who were here to speak to say, we're not gonna speak. 
Um, so you have to really consider what your, not just your words, but also your mannerisms. And that goes for other board members too, that sometimes you are on your phones, one person in particular, and sometimes you stare out into space when people are talking. And you may not actually know you're doing that, but you are. And what that does to the community who comes here and wants to speak to important issues is that it makes them feel that they're not being heard. And um, I am one of those people who sometimes when I come here, I think what's the point of even talking to you if you're not taking our ideas or our opinions seriously? I mean, I know that um, you have your own personal political agenda and there are things that you intend to try and achieve that some of us want to disagree with. And we want to give you some logical reasons that there may a be a different approach to um, transgender youth in bathrooms and sports and transgender youth participating in sports. And we might have another idea of how you can handle that. And we wanna be heard. So um, I don't really think an apology is enough, although I think that was a sincere apology. It, it's not enough. Um, we need somebody to chair these meetings and we need board members at these meetings who will take seriously what the public is asking, recommending, saying. Uh, we do research. We, we try to prepare when we're going to speak before you. So um, I also want to say that I don't think it's a good example for the students. If a student were to say those words to a teacher at school or another student, they would be reprimanded in some way, um, if not suspended. So. I don't think you should, you should be held to a higher standard than the students. Thank you. <clears throat> Leslie Hokelson. Leslie Hokelson. Why is it okay for the school board members to call citizens of our county a piece of shit and other people calling other community members Marxist, woke, communist, and Biden is not our president? These comments were not addressed and some were made by the sitting board. But when I said President Jensen had a hissy fit because she didn't like the former council's direction, she called me out on it. The board's political agenda is not in the best interest of our students or community. It's been brought up that teachers in Douglas County make less than other surrounding communities. Why would any teacher want to work in Douglas County when board members call citizens pieces of shit and don't call anyone out when they continue to get up here and call people Marxist, woke, and communist? President Jensen, your tears are a little late and only sh be, being shed because you've been, been called out on it. And I think you owe more than an apology. Your words have been absolutely disgusting. Thank you. Martha Betcher. Hello, my name is Martha Betcher. I've watched many Douglas County school boards over the last 30 years. Names come to mind like Alicia Smalley, Randy Green, Charlie, Charla Hales, Terry Jamin, Mary Bennington, and many more folks who willingly accepted this underappreciated role that is virtually vitally important here in our small, small community. Our public schools provide a means to bring all of us together as a community to support and foster learning for our kids here in Douglas County. I'm speaking today as a retired Douglas County educator, parent, Douglas County voter, and taxpayer. I am angry with your recent preposterous decision to hire Joey Gilbert for school district legal counsel. Not only did he admit he has no education law experience, but he also allowed he will likely contract with Moppin, Cox, and Lagoy, the firm you fired, 
and all this will likely cost the school district $30,000 more or more per year than before. It was, it's a funny thing. I thought conservatives like to save money, not throw it after frivolous cultural war dreams that have no real basis in this community. Given the recent hot mic fiasco on the part of President Susan Jansen, it seems very clear that manners, self-control, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and responsible decision-making are a skill set she needs help with. Interestingly enough, they are all included in the thing called SEL or social emotional learning. It's never too late to learn new stuff, Mrs. Jansen. Clearly, Dickerson, Jansen, Burns, and Engelkirk have a burr in their saddle regarding transgender issues. That seems to explain how we ended up with Joey Gilbert, as he will fight for you. And you look at his website, and we've got DUI, personal injury, immigration law, criminal law representation. Nowhere did I see education law listed in that you know, collection of things that he's offering. So here we are in Douglas County with our own personal set of culture wars. Um, it's political. This is just plain counterproductive and a waste of time and taxpayer money. You're supposed to function as a nonpartisan group and what you were doing is an absolute travesty of what a functional school board should be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Rich McGuffin. Rich McGuffin. At the last special meeting of the board, it became readily apparent that the decision to terminate the contract with MCL and hire Joey Gilbert Law Firm had been decided long before the meeting, making a mockery of community input and public discourse. You seem bent on doing the bidding of a political pack to satisfy an ide ideological agenda and turn a deaf ear to those who disagree with you. At that same July 19th meeting, community members were held in contempt and verbally assaulted and demeaned by President Jansen. You have already heard from my wife. Even fellow board uh, trustees were publicly disrespected by you, President Jansen. President Jansen, you said during your campaign, and I quote, the school board is the most important elected body in, the wor in today's world. We need adults with integrity watching over our schools. My opponent should not sit on the board. He makes rude comment, rude remarks during public comment and has verbally attacked, <coughs> excuse me, attacked my friend Virginia Starrett several times, even using profanity. I want this board to represent this community with dignity and honor. I will always do that and be respectful and transparent to all." End of quote. President Jansen, while I commend you for apologizing for your verbal assault on my wife, she was not the only member of my family you called a piece of shit. You still have some apologizing to do. Your behavior at the last board meeting during public comment violated the promises you made during your campaign to represent this community with dignity and honor. You did not keep your promises to be respectful to all. You have lost my trust and I have no confidence that you can continue to function in the best interest of the citizens of Douglas County, our school administrators, our teachers, staff, and most especially our students. I'm calling on you today to demonstrate the integrity you said you value and resign as school board trustee. Thank you. Casey Rogers. Is this on? Casey Rogers for the record. First and foremost, I want to thank you, Joey Gilbert, for choosing to sit here and do this and take on education law. We have never needed someone like you more than ever. I'd like to state that I have a book written by a liberal for liberals. In fact, 
I took $150 out of my own pocket and bought each of one of you this book because the ignorance of this board and the past few years have been astounding. The new board has come to change that because what you did in 2020 to, 20, to the present was absolutely horrendous and wrong. I expect you all to be held accountable as leaders for what you did to 5,333 students and the staff. In this book, it talks about, contrary to official promises, the vaccines did not prevent infection or transmission. You have held nonstop vaccine clinics on your school property. After 15 of us came for the past three years telling you, telling you that they were wrong, that it was all a lie, and you did it and went along with it. Regardless of what Sisolak did or not, he's equated to Hitler and you did what Hitler wanted. That makes you equally responsible. High injury and death rates from COVID vaccines may cancel out even the most exaggerated claims of vaccine efficiency. Mass vaccination has preceded global rises in excessive death. Pharma and CDC have hidden the damaging, the damning injury and death data reports with cooperation from leading media outlets, including the New York Times. Should government technocrats be partnering with, partner, partnering with media and social media titans to censor and suppress the questioning of government policies? Virtually all my earlier predictions have matured from conspiracy theories to proven facts. Masks are ineffective and dangerous. Social distancing was not science-based. School closures were not science-based. And before I go any further, because you all will be receiving this book, you need to know that I'm talking to you four because I know that you will vote for this. I hope and pray that you have AMA or ADA um, defibrillators in every part of this school because teenagers, because of the vaccine, uh, epidemic that they pushed onto everybody. We need to help our teenagers because they are having heart attacks. Thank you. Marty Swisher. Marty Swisher, Gardnerville resident. At the school board meeting on Wednesday, July 19th, a gentleman who accompanied Mr. Gilbert to the meeting spoke in public comment. He made some disparaging statements about the performance of our students and staff that I, many teachers, counselors, and community members take issue with. I wanna make sure the public has accurate information concerning the important work of our students and staff and the value of graduating from Douglas County School District. The gentleman made the following claims. Your graduation rate is 93%. Actually, the Nevada report card validates the district's graduation rate in 2022 at 84.5%. About 50% test functionally illiterate. Half do not have the skills to function. Almost one in five is special education. The Nevada report card validated that 13.8% of Douglas County students receive special education services in 2022. Half of kids don't have reading and math skills. The last state going on about 12 years is the state of Nevada. 50% of kids are non are not functionally literate, and he repeated this claim. Nobody is, is tackling the problem. Half of kids are failing every year. This is educational malpractice. During a recess in the meeting, I went over and introduced myself to our visitor. I asked him where he got his information to support his claims about the performance of our school district. He said that the National Assessment of Education Progress test and the SBAC scores showed it. When I asked him to be specific about Douglas County's performance, he was unable to give me specifics. We also discussed the ACT and the fact that it is now required for all juniors. And in the past, when it was optional, our average composite scores, like most other states, was far above the scale score of 22 for college entrance. He was not able to share any specifics about Douglas County uh, student academic performance or the program of study to substantiate any of his claims. 
These insinuations are damaging to our staff and our school community because they suggest that teachers are simply promoting students and not ensuring that students clearly demonstrate functional literacy and skills to succeed after high school. I've emailed all the board members with details about testing and comparison data with other states that do similar testing. And I hope that you'll take a careful look at that. Here are some key points I think we need to know. Douglas County makes up for 1.1% of Nevada student population. So it's, it is not reasonable to lump our student performance in with the state. When you review the comparable state results for 2022 in SBAC and ACT, you will find that Douglas County school district results are at or above most other states. Lastly, and most importantly, the ACT has only required participation as a graduation requirement for Nevada schools. The real threshold for graduation is the daily work in our classrooms and the careful assessment of our teachers. In order for a student to make it to graduation and achieve a Douglas County high school diploma, he or she would minimally need to pass three classes of English and math and two classes of social studies and science in middle school and at least four classes of English that was 30 seconds. Wow. Um, <laughs> the first bell, he was six minutes old. Uh, let him go. Thank you, Mr. Swisher. Thank you to our teachers. Nick Mayer. Nicholas Meyer for the record. There is something really broken about DCSD hiring practices. How is it that the district can hire a former teacher from Washoe who has a restraining order against him for stalking and who is a defendant in a civil lawsuit where it is alleged that he assaulted and abused a disabled student? How is this possible? And how is it that after Superintendent Lewis was notified and given all the information on this individual, that the superintendent allowed this individual to continue to teach up till the time he was arrested? The board needs to get ahead of this issue right away to demonstrate to the community and parents that the safety and security of students and staff is the top priority. As recommendations, first, the board should authorize legal counsel to immediately review the hiring practices and background check process that the district performs on potential hires. Second, the board needs to authorize a forensic audit of all communications between HR staff, administration, and the superintendent regarding this hire. We need to know who knew what and when, and review all internal email and text communications. Last, the board should place the superintendent on administrative leave until the completion of this investigation. There is no question that the superintendent was given all the pertinent information on this individual in March, yet he continued to allow this individual to teach, putting staff and students in jeopardy. This demonstrates a callous disregard for the safety of students and staff and is a most serious offense. Again, the board needs to get ahead of this issue. The hiring process at DCSD is broken and the safety of staff and students are on the line. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have anyone else on the list, so just come on up and then you can tell me your name. Let's take one online while she's getting ready. She'll go second. Amanda Adams, go ahead. Hi, can you guys Hi. hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I'm having to zoom in tonight because our family just had to move out of Douglas County. And one of the main reasons was because our two teenage children did not feel comfortable or welcomed um, after some of the recent 
conversations and rhetoric from the new school board as well as others. Um, we had to leave a family or our family had to leave the town that you know our kids grew up in Tahoe, they're Barton babies, moved down to Douglas seven years ago and loved it there. Uh, but as a parent, I'm sure you guys could all understand that I couldn't force my kids or have them be in a place where they felt hated or not wanted. Uh, both of my kids are LGBT, I will let you know that. Uh, so are most of their friends who are still in Douglas. There are a few other families looking to move as well, but most um, don't have the means that we had to be able to uproot and move our family with it a month's notice. Um, we've only been our house for four days, our new place, and our kids are already all smiles and thanking us for the move that we made. Um, makes me very sad because of the fact that, you know, they had to leave their friends and the place that they grew up and were born and knew. Um, but for their happiness, I was happy to do it. Um, you know, new job is nothing compared to my children's happiness. So the new board members pushing for the trans ban was really the final straw. And I know they don't want to call it the trans ban, but it's really, that's what it is. Just call a duck a duck. Um, just the rhetoric. It wasn't just the conversations. It was the, the way things were being presented. Um, secondly, the hiring of Joey Gilbert, who I know he's there. He has no experience in education law. I'm glad he admitted that at the last meeting. Um, I can only imagine if I went to my clients as a real estate agent and said, hey, you know what? I'll, I might do okay. I'll do some research, but uh, you know, I'll fight for you, but I don't know what I'm doing and I have no experience in what you need me to do, um, but you know, I'll get there. It just, it I boggles the mind. I would really love to, to know what he's doing to be educated in education law <laughs> because from my experience and attorneys I've talked to, it's a lifelong profession um, due to all of the, the legal hoops that you have to jump through representing a school board. Um, I really hope that you guys don't just bankrupt our, the school district. I still call it ours, but it's not anymore. Uh, my old school district, um, Douglas County has great, great things going for it. Um, that's why we lived there. And I know a lot of people that are remaining there that really have their fingers crossed and hope that you guys will do the right thing. Not, you know, stop with the hateful rhetoric, the comment at the last meeting, which President Jansen apologized for earlier. Thank you for that apology. That was just, just hurtful and hateful. And there's no place for talk like that. Um, same with previous meetings. There's been other discussion that was just Thank you. rude. For the record, Laura Cadeau, and I'm here to stand with the MacGuffins. I heard your apology. It sounded sincere but I expect a leader to come forward and own your mistakes. I expected this board to address that first, first thing. And I think it says a lot about character that the gracious Mrs. McGuffin had to ask for the apology. I also think I went back and rewatched the video and what you said you maligned the characters of two MacGuffins was intentional. I think that those who are sitting near you heard it. And I also think you owe us an apology. Nobody spoke up at the time to say, stop that. And nobody addressed the issue prior to being called out by Mrs. MacGuffin. Totally inappropriate for a leadership position. I agree with her. I think you should be censored. I think all of you owe an apology and you should be ashamed of yourself for the way that you are conducting yourself as board members of this community. Since I have some more time, I'm just briefly gonna say, I definitely support raises for teachers. I definitely would have rather seen our excess money go towards them rather than Mr. Gilbert. And I was shocked, and, and this one's on me. I should have been doing my homework. What Ms. Hyatt said about the shortage in the school is beyond alarming. And those are the issues that we, the people of this community want you to be addressing. Forget the other 
private agendas, that's an important issue. We need teachers in the school. We have a lot to offer them. This is a beautiful community. Pay them. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, May Hyatt. <clears throat> I'm here to speak and to share my thoughts as to the manner by which school board meetings have been conducted these last several months. First and foremost, I wanna let you know that I also stand with the MacGuffin family. I don't agree with the way that they were treated. Neither Mr. MacGuffin nor Mrs. MacGuffin deserve to be spoken to that way, whether it's on hot mic or not. Um, any of us who speak on public comment, um, don't deserve to be addressed that way, any of us. Um, one thing that I always tell my kids, we are free to think however we want to think, but the second you write it down, the second you type it up and you publish it, the second you speak it and it comes out of your mouth, you can't take it back. You can't take it back. Right here I have a copy of the Douglas County School District Code of Conduct. I have highlighted many of the things that I feel in my opinion are violations of the school district board code of conduct. I'm gonna read a few of them out, out loud as to some of the violations that I feel this school board has kind of just not addressed. Um, item number 10, board members will be prepared and open-minded when speaking to the issues on the agenda. Each board member should seek to understand all sides of a topic as presented by fellow board members and all other speakers. Item number seven, board members carry a public trust and should carry out their duties in a professional and courteous manner. Board members should strive to present their views in a professional and respectful manner, working with fellow board members in the spirit of harmony and cooperation in spite of differences of opinion. Board members should extend every courtesy to those who appear before the board. Nonverbal communication must be respectful. As a means of fulfilling its mission, each board member will uphold and enforce all laws, state board rules and regulations. I don't know how you're gonna do that if you're going to be violating this whole anti-trans thing. Resist every temptation and outside pressure to use their position as a school board member to benefit either themselves or any other individual agency apart from the total interest of the school jurisdiction. Make decisions in terms of the educational welfare of children and strive for public schools which can meet the individual needs of every learner, regardless of race, gender, creed, disability, social standing, and sexual orientation. Understand and abide by the open meeting law. Refuse to surrender independent judgment to special interest or partisan pol political groups or to use the schools for personal gain or for the gain of their friends. Violation of these principles Thank will you, be addressed by the board president. When will the board president address these issues and violations? Jim McCallop. I would like to support our new school board members. I think they deserve a chance. There's a lot of problems to solve. Let's face it, they would not have been elected if the public was happy with the way the schools were running. This was asked for by the public for change. Change sometimes ruffles feathers, but it doesn't mean it, it isn't a good thing in the long run. One of the reasons I supported them was not for some anti-trans agenda, but to support the rights of girls and young women in sports. These are rights that took a long time to win. Title IX took a long time, it was a battle. I remember, remember when organizations like the ACLU were in favor of the rights of girls and women to be in sports. Now they seem to have found a new group of people. It's not a, an attack on the trans community or any other community, support the rights of women and girls in sports. It took a long time to get funding 
long time to get equal funding with the boys sports. Now it's going to mean to be thrown away when a new group comes along that people care about. There is a, there's a lot of challenges the school board's going to face. And if the community, community would just support them, give them the chance to do their job, there's challenges on budget and other items coming up on contracts for teachers. We want them to have the public support to do the best job they can. Thank you. Thank you. Virginia Starrett for the record. Politics can be ugly, mean, and hypocritical. Lately, particularly at the national level, it has frequently been all three at the same time. Even in our rural small town, people with strong feelings about something may strike out using a tone and words that don't belong in polite conversation. Social media seems to be a magnet for just such acting out. I've been in politics long enough to state unequivocally that exploiting a blunder made by one's opposition is de rigueur. I've also been in politics long enough to recognize how organized the dishonest manipulation and personal attacks, many aimed at me, filling current local media are. It is no secret that those who are in agreement with our schools stirring up race hostility, taking over values training from parents, and sexualizing students through promotion of LBGTQIA issues in classrooms and school libraries do not like the get polit political ideology out of our school's direction this school board is taking. I honestly don't know if any or many of these folks realize that they are aligning themselves with Marxism and following the strategies originally infused into education by Brazilian Marxist Paulo Freire, but they are. In any case, the board president became the scapegoat for dumping as many caustic, cruel remarks as possible into the public square, and of course, a recall has been mentioned. Never mind that anyone who spends a minute on pretty much any media is inundated with far more obscene words and messages, and never mind that even the current president of the United States openly uses profanity in addressing the people. I would be very surprised if any of those who line up to throw flaming darts of condemnation can sincerely claim they were shocked or in any manner actually even angered by the deliberately twisted story of what happened. The remark was not intended or directed at anyone except another board trustee. The sound was doctored on the video and the maker of the remark apologized for it instantly when she learned it had been made public. The fact that the reporter didn't see fit to quote that explicit apology in her article is just another unfortunate happenstance in the entire overblown affair. We are in an American values versus wokes values war. We who support the board in enacting policies that protect teachers, students, and parents know it. And those who don't know it too. This is all posturing by the opponents for political gain and that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Virginia Neese. Virginia Neese for the record. Our three new school board trustees were elected by a large majority of Douglas County citizens. I've heard in the last six school board meetings over and over and over about the 70 residents that took the survey. This survey was sent out shortly after our new members were elected without their knowledge, nor were they told what questions were on it. Hmm, why? It was a tool by the leftist school board members to oppose the newly elected ones. We heard all about what the community wanted based on this minuscule survey for weeks after by trustee Gilkerson as if it were representative of the whole of Douglas County. Shortly after that, FOIA requests for personal email and text messages of the new trustees were litigated by Sour Grapes Loser, Trustee Lehman and Henchman McGuffin against the three new trustees. Make no mistake, this was a personal attack. They hoped, as is the case with our former US president, to find embarrassing information and create a smokescreen of misinformation and continuous litigation to disillusion the public towards these new trustees. They hoped to prove that the new trustees violated open meeting law so as to snare them into resignation. The Attorney General has found no cause to date. 
I would be so frustrated by this personal attack and direct attack on my life as a trustee that I would most certainly be unable to control my private comments to another colleague either. This comment, even though private, had to be amplified so much so to the, even to the point that it was almost unrecognizable. Again, it was a private conversation. Let's compare and contrast a verbal private comment to a fellow trustee against the legal attack and FOIA requests from someone's private emails and texts in a court of law. Our school board meetings have been fraught with overly extended public comment sessions from a core group of these sour grape left wingers. They are here today all the same faces. They are persistent and vocal on all social media rags like next door. They write volumes of opposition letters to the record courier also left leaning and get published way more than the conservatives in this valley. One letter to every five. This makes them look powerful in the eyes of the media. However, this is not a true representation of our conservative community, nor is it the truth. We should know by now this happens regularly. Mis misrepresentation and misdirection Thank you, are the tools of the left. Thank you. Megan Kelly, go ahead. Go ahead and unmute, Megan. Megan, we'll come back. Wow. Um, Adrian Sawyer, for the record, parent of three DCSD students. The reason for the July 19th meeting was because the majority of the board had lost trust in their law firm. After multiple hot mic moments at the last meeting, the board has lost the public's trust. And I want to mention that one of those hot mic moments was directed towards a grandmother and parent of Douglas County School District students, the people you're supposed to represent. While the board felt that they could not repair their trust in the law firm, I would like to believe the board can work towards regaining public trust. Let's stop with policies that break the law in Nevada's constitution and could potentially result in the loss of all sports scholarships. Let's stop with the witch hunt for CRT and vilifying teachers. Let's stop with talk of our children being downloaded and indoctrinated. None of this is productive. I understand the majority has not, of the board has not lived here very long and has not raised their, raised their children in Douglas County School District. Visiting a class once a month, going to an expulsion hearing, going to a music performance or a graduation does not give you an accurate understanding of real issues facing the district. We should be working together, not fighting over politically charged what ifs. I'd like to believe the board has my children's best interests at heart. I would like to believe we can work together to solve real problems. But until this board puts aside its predetermined agenda and actually listens to everyone making the effort to be heard, public trust cannot be restored. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Demasa Miller. I was a student at Garnerville Elementary School. I was a student at Carson Valley Middle School and at Douglas High School. I am now one of your employees. I work at Minden Elementary School. I am here only because the behavior that's being presented in the audience is not a good representation of our school in our district. I proudly serve your district outside of my contract time. I never go to Walmart in my pajamas. I never look ridiculous. I don't embarrass you in public because I'm proud to be a part of the school district. I know the McGuffins. Richie is my, my son's baseball coach. They're good people. I understand you had a private comment, but your private comment had no right to be in this meeting. None of these comments have a right to be at these meetings. There is name calling, there's accusations, all of which are not founded on anything besides opinions. 
I, ap I appreciate all of you coming to our schools and seeing what we're doing, but I agree with Adrienne, who her children have gone to MES. Until you're in there all the time, you have no idea what we're doing. We have spoken numerous times about how our school district needs to fund teachers. And I've said this before, we constantly villainize teachers. There is no way that anyone wants to work for the school district for the pay that they get, regardless if there's a 12% or 15% pay increase. By making us be the problem, by making teachers be the problem, nobody wants to work for you. You're supposed to have our backs, just like we have your backs, just like we hold ourselves to an expectation in our meetings, in public, anywhere. I am asking for you to be a better leader for us. I'm asking all of you to represent us. I am embarrassed that I work for this school district and that all of the news articles were put out the way that they were. I deserve better. My sons deserve better. Our community deserves better. This is not what we are about. So I hope that you guys will all take a moment to reconsider how we want these meetings to go for the 23-24 school year and how we can support our teachers better by highlighting concerns, there's nothing wrong with highlighting a concern, but when you are commenting and disrespecting teachers the way that they have been conducted in these meetings, we are going to have a very big problem. And for me personally, I would like for my sons to be able to graduate Douglas High School, just like their great grandmother was able to graduate from Douglas High School. So please do better for us. We are trying to do better for you. Please do better for us. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Grace McGuffin. I am a female athlete. I am on the Douglas soccer team and the Douglas ski team. If you want to protect me, obey the law. If you pass a law based on a non-existent issue, all the student athletes might lose their ability to play sports. If you pass a policy that violates the Nevada constitution, then NIAA might kick DHS out. This means that none of us will be able to play sports. Is this protecting me? Thank you. Thank you. Tom Sterrett for the record. A point upon which no one can disagree is that a school superintendent must represent with unwavering fidelity the school board which has employed him. Should the governing philosophy of that school board change, the superintendent doesn't just go on as if nothing has happened. Rather, he conforms with the direction of the new board in its lawful instructions or he resigns. He does not resist, undermine, or hinder this board, for so to do would constitute cause for dismissal. But that seems to be what is taking place here with respect to Superintendent Lewis. Take, for example, item 19 on the May 16th agenda, Girls' Rights, which was egregiously misagendized under or by Superintendent Lewis from, as instructed, Girls' Rights to transgenderism, resulting in and still causing today public outcry. The superintendent did or caused this of his own will, contrary to specific instruction as established by the minutes, and waited to spring this misagendized item upon an unsuspecting board until too late to correct. In effect, Superintendent Lewis blindsided this board. But wait, there's more. Superintendent Lewis further deliberately disregarded instructions as to the straightforward language requested by President Jansen regarding the legal services agenda item by instead, without permission, modifying that, 11, that item 11 on the June 13th agenda and once again, caused this modified item to be withheld from this board until too late to correct, blindsided again. 
Common sense dictates that the proposed agenda should be prepared and delivered to this board well in advance. Lewis has not done so. Further, Lewis at the June 13th meeting participated in steering this board into an unduly complex RFP when none was ever required in the first place. Lewis had a duty to point this out then, but failed so to do. All of the foregoing wasted time, cost money and effort simply stated, Lewis has demonstrably indicated that he is at cross purposes with this board and does not intend to change. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think everybody needs to take a nice deep breath, right? Um, I am going to even use part of my time to request that every single one of you make eye contact with me the entire time that I'm speaking. Okay, please show respect. My name is Julianne Stittick, and for context, I own a company that makes social emotional learning for children. Okay, I'm also the mother of a transgender. Okay, I would like eye contact, please. Thank you. I don't, I would like your eye contact to take your notes later, please. Thank you. Um, people prepare their statements, and when you are staring down and have negative, nonverbal language when they are putting themselves out there in an uncomfortable situation is terrible. And it's not leadership skills. It is not you all standing up as leaders. I am new to this community. I was just called a left wing because I'm a Republican and I have a child that has a, that's transgender, okay? This isn't okay. I moved to this community because I wanted a loving environment of people who had strong values of love and kindness. And that's what I'm calling for, is all I hear is a bunch of fighting. And what I wanna hear is solutions. I wanna hear what you're doing to fix these things. And I can tell you this, there is not one transgender child, human being out there, that wants to change their clothes in front of anyone. And that's where I'm gonna close. Jan Muzzy for the record. I appreciate what a number of people have had to say this afternoon. And I appreciate well, I want to let May Hyatt know that I heard what she had to say. However, she neglected to include another group of people who have been openly hostile to the school board since they were elected and before they were even seated. These people have already have, to, in my opinion, have already made a predetermined decision on how these are uh, the elected board officials will be. Shame on them. They've already determined that they were, they were not going to be liked by this, by this group. They have been dis disruptive and insulting, as we have heard and seen when Virginia Sterrett spoke, when uh, Jin, uh, Virginia Neese spoke, and others have spoken. Shame on them that they do not practice what they say. I would also like to comment one speaker, I don't, I didn't jot down her name, uh, said that uh, the school board has denigrated our teachers. I have not heard any one of these school board members do such a thing. And to be accused of doing something that they have never done, I find absolutely outrageous. I am also there, and I'm thankful to see that the sheriffs have deputies have, have arrived. There was a gentleman last meeting, the special meeting, that I felt very concerned and nervous. And I see that he's here again this evening. And I still do not feel comfortable around this man 
and his outrageous actions that he distressed me so much that I went to the sheriff and asked him to please pay attention to this man because I was sitting right behind him. And I just feel very concerned about the presence of this person. And I believe you know who you are. So in closing, thank you, Mr. Gilbert, for being here. Thank you, school board, for hiring Mr. Gilbert. Just go. Okay. Um, I'm Gail Jacobs. I'm a licensed clinical therapist in town who works extensively with employee assistance programs, critical incident debriefings with fire departments, etc. Um, I have a 35 year history, a large majority of that working in schools. Years ago, I did training in Mono County, Alpine County, Sacramento County, and Washoe County, a program called Developing Capable People. And one of the premises of that is when we look at people and what we hold is, if you don't believe what I believe, then you're defective. And I think that we have seen nothing but that for several years in the making. Um, my child went to school here. We moved here from Mammoth so my child could attend high school here. Had an incredible, incredible, delightful experience, unfortunately, in the middle school. He had some interactions with Mr. Lewis, who handed it. He's not in prison, so he did a good <laughs> job. Um, but I think the level of shaming, I think one of the things that happened to us is during COVID, I was teaching up at UNR in the graduate program and was forced to become an online teacher, not my area of giftedness. And every teacher I have spoken to was traumatized by this. Most children also were traumatized by this. Anyone that has worked in a classroom and tried to keep children's attention for more than 20 minutes at a time would understand that. And so I would encourage people Number one, to get training on how to operate as a board, for heaven's sakes, how to collaborate, how to come together when you don't agree for the good of the children. And for people that are paranoid about all the issues around sexuality, if your child has a cell phone, I'm here to tell you what they're learning isn't coming from the school. And so I would just ask people, to be aware of all the other influencers that your children are exposed to. And my hope would be that it's not people of the community and school board that sometimes are behaving in the way I have had to advocate middle schoolers peer mediation for. So I'm just asking people to come to their higher self and do what's best for the children and not treat people that don't believe like you as defective. That Critical thinking is what children need to learn more than anything, and that has to come from us. Thank you. Thank you. Megan Kelly, go ahead. Yeah, hi, sorry about earlier. I wasn't able to unmute fast enough. This is Megan Kelly. Um, I'm just, you know, there was a lot of anger last meeting. And um, I think that, I think the frustration stems from the people in support of the board. They don't even have children in this district and they maybe never had children in this district. There wasn't, they have, they're pretty new to town or within the last decade. And they're trying to set the policy for the school district, which we don't really have any of these problems. This has been a great school district. I mean, we're only three years in, um, but I think I, I haven't noticed any of these made up problems that um, the board is bringing to our attention that are just national news. They're not here in our small community. And I think it would just help if the board would focus on 
many of the other things that have already been said tonight, you know, teacher compensation, staff compensation, you know, Carson City just gave their teachers a huge raise. And so how are we going to retain staff at this school district? I think the other things they could focus on is, is some of the stuff that we could all get behind, like, you know, maybe getting rid of the common core math and going back to the old math so we can compete with, you know, some of the Asian countries and, and have the, the smartest and best and brightest or just bringing back things like spelling. I mean, if that's the kind of stuff that they were talking about that maybe comes from media and, and, and I think everybody would get behind that, but it just seems like they have brought all of these issues and, and we're all just terrified that it's just a huge distraction and we're gonna not be eligible for federal grants and we're gonna be embarrassed in the newspapers across this country. And we know that Douglas County isn't like that. Some of the previous speakers said, that this is full of a bunch of left-wing people. I mean, I'm not a left-wing person. I'm registered as a Republican. I don't think that that's true. I think those are divisive statements. And I just think we want this to be a nonpartisan position. And we want to focus on the issues that the school district has. And that's all we want. And that we're frustrated because we're parents, we're busy, we have young children. We'd rather not be sitting on public common or sitting at a meeting for an hour. We'd rather be spending time with our kids or limited time. But meanwhile, there's people who don't even have kids in the district who are retired, have all the time in the world, you know, driving this policy. So I just want people to think about that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hello? Sally Bowman. Susan, I was surprised at your comment. I wasn't here for that part of it. But the Lord I serve commands me to forgive, and I forgive you. And another thing, everything today is political, and that includes education. It's been here since the 90s, and it's sickening to see. And we support the board, and thank you for all your work. It's not an easy job. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mino Stopson for the record. And before I begin, I wanna state that all thoughts and things I say are representation of my personal opinions and nobody else's. Um, I graduated in 2022. I was, um, I received all my education here from DCSC and it was probably, I mean, it's best. I, I couldn't complain if I had to look back, you know, of course, being in fourth grade and I had to go to school for every day, five days a week for nine months out of the year, or however many, of course, I was like, I don't want to go to school. I hate it, whatever. Um, I love Douglas County a lot. I've lived here my whole life. Um, I'm very proud to live here. This is a very important place to me. Um, I have a deep connection with the Sierra Nevadas. Um, I have a lot of respect for them and just members in our community as well. Um, it's really disheartening to see how things are going right now. It makes me very sad to witness it all. I mean, I was brought up in Douglas County School Districts and I was taught to love one another, you know, especially I attended MES and I had some, some of the best teachers on this planet and they always taught us to love one another. And I don't see that here. I see a room filled with hate and sadness. It's really disheartening to me. And I am seriously considering my future here in Douglas County. I wanted to set up, start a family here and grow old with somebody and live my life in Douglas County. And I, I really don't know if I can do that anymore because I'm just really disheartened and I'm asking that you guys please learn how to work together. There has to be growth on both sides. This cannot continue. This is, this breaks my heart. I just, I, I can't, I don't ha know any other way to describe it. Um, I didn't have a lot of friends in the school district and teachers were my ally and they really backed me up and really helped me become the person I am today. And I'm just asking that you guys please try to unify and rationalize with one another. Thank you. Thank you.
Marcus, go ahead. Hello there. I, I hope everyone can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Can everyone hear me? I'm sorry. I, I'm in I'm at girls golf practice and I can't it's breaking up quite a bit. Marcus, we can hear you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Marcus Zinke for the record. Um, I find it quite troubling that in a recent Record Courier article, the campaign manager and clear representative of several trustees on this board insinuated that the parent group and others were the opposition. That's very telling of this board to say such a thing, and your actions have proven these remarks to be true. It is all too common now that school boards around the country are in opposition to the parents and by default to the students. This is true no matter what side of the aisle you are on. This representative also stated that said parent group and others show up to every meeting and harass this board. I will state again, as I have at many of these meetings, our parent group is exactly that, parents, the people that you should be most concerned with appeasing. The parents know what they want for their kids and generally know what's best for them. Our group is open to all parents, parents of different backgrounds, parents with different ideas, parents with differing opinions. And that ladies and gentlemen is the point. We have differing opinions. That is okay, that is normal. Admonishing the crown for its behavior and then calling a speaker an expletive could not be further from appropriate behavior. And why? Because of opinion that doesn't line up with your own? You know nothing about the constituents that you speak of at your meetings. How can you decide that someone is a POS when you don't know them? How upon first meeting and a difference of opinion can you call someone such a thing? We are not going to all agree. That is the beauty of this. Someone might have a great idea that you never thought of. Someone might still have insight into something you know nothing about. Others might appreciate the actions of this board. Does this mean that any of them are good or bad people or their, their opinions matter more or less? No, it just makes them people. There's a gentleman that sits in this crowd every meeting to agree and sing your praises, and yet he is consistently out of line with his behavior and his actions. He is so out of line with his behavior, he's the only person I've seen escorted out by police, the only one, but his beliefs are in line with yours, so he's good. He's not a POS. Do not be afraid of differing opinions. They are just that, opinions. The trouble is you have a clear cut agenda and you are emboldened by the opposition to enforce it. Instead of taking into consideration the opposition, the parents, the faculty, and the children, you are steadfast in the idea that your agenda is the best way and nothing will stop you in passing it. Nary a thought of unintended consequences. Heck, never a thought of consequences. Lastly, there was a complaint about how long the board meetings are taking. Have you ever thought of why that is? It's because people are in disagreement with what you're doing and it seems as though you don't care. Our parent group gets upwards of 70 people filling out our surveys for each board meeting. These surveys are unbiased, comprehensive, and honest. Parents are required to attach their names to them to validate what they have chosen and what they have written. Zero anonymity. Your board meetings are taking hours and hours with less than 70 people talking and yet time and again, our group is brushed aside as not having enough members to be relevant. Thank you, How Mr. Zink. It's Thank time you, to take the parent group a little more seriously. Rob Lehman, for the record. Um, as I look around this room today, I think there are let's see, seven of you, me, maybe a couple others who know what it's like to be on the board and President Jansen, you're gonna find a strange ally in me tonight because I've thought Richie's the same thing a couple times and I've thought it and I've thought people who have spoken here have been the same thing. Of course, me and Richie are very good friends. And so I say that in jest about him, but I, I understand how frustrating it is when people get up here and say stuff, I get that. I don't, I don't blame you for your feelings. So you got a strange ally in me tonight. Um, what I really wanted to talk about is two things. One that Virginia Neese brought up and another is very concerning. First, Ms. Neese talked about a public records request. She called it a FOIA request. That's a, that's a federal request. We did a public records request. That's a Nevada request for documents, for, for communications between you guys. And we did that because as, as it says in the open meeting law and the public records, it's, it's kind of a bedmark of our democracy. Having transparency and knowing what our public officials are talking about is very important. And that's why the public records request exists. And Ms. Niche said that we were requesting private conversations and that's just not true. I asked her to maybe talk to Mr. Gilbert after this meeting so he can explain to her the decision made in Lyon County um, versus Comstock when the Comstock court 
ruled that communications on private devices, so long as they're talking about board items, are actually public record. And that's all that was requested. We don't want to know what you're having for dinner. We don't want to know what you're doing with your spouse. We just wanted to know what's going on with board items. And that's all that was requested. So I wanted to clarify that for Mrs. Nish. But the thing that's most important to me is where I see everything going. And we saw first that Mr. Meyer um, asked this board to get rid of council and hire new council, and that happened. And tonight he's now asked the first step to get rid of our superintendent. He's asked that he be put on administrative leave. And this is sad and shocking. Our superintendent is one of the best superintendents this board has had. I had, a, I had the benefit of working with two fantastic superintendents. They both had different pro pros and cons, both had different strengths and weaknesses. And Mr. Lewis has, an amaz has amazing strengths and he is really suited to leading this district in this valley. And it would be very unfortunate if this board just followed along with Mr. Meyer's next request. So please, please, I guess I'm talking may, maybe more to the people in the audience that this is coming up and we need to worry about it. And he's not sabotaging the board, as Tom Starrett said. The exact words that Mrs. Jansen said for the not transgender one was whether students who are biologically male at birth and whether they can participate in female sports and use girls' bathrooms and locker rooms and students who are biologically female at birth and whether they can participate in male sports and use bathrooms. That, that's what was said. That's a, that's a transgender policy. That's what that is. Just call it duck a duck. If you're calling of what somebody was at birth, thank you. You know what? I love America because we can sit in a room and we can disagree like we are. This is the greatest country in the world. And I firmly believe this. You know, I didn't take a summer vacation. I had a month off to go do anything, but I stayed in this valley and I drove around this valley before all this and after all the July meeting. And I love this valley. You know, Jim, we, Jim over there, Republican Party, we had a great conversation at the last board meeting. And that dialogue was just absolutely awesome. And we may disagree on different pieces, but it doesn't, it didn't matter. Jim, didn't we have a pretty good conversation? Yeah, and when I came in, I saw you, I saw it the, at the farmer's market. What a great conversation. I get accused of, of inti basically intimidating, but at, at that last meeting, nobody knew that somebody walked up to me, called me out, and I had to, I had to back out. I don't want any piece of this. But I didn't, I didn't report that to the sheriff. I was, that was actually in front of the sheriff. But here's the thing. This, this, when Jim and I spoke, there's a flyer that went out, and here's the fact why the election came down the way it was. You, hey, did a great job. You had three people that were supported that were on the, on, the, on the card and that went to the election and it was sort of supported by a clerk I talked to. And they just went, man, you guys were organized. Landslide, uh, if you win by a thousand votes, if it tips 501, that's not a landslide. But the thing is, is that a little bit of manipulation happened you, you manip manipulated the old valley and the roots of the valley and the car and Mr. Burns, I like the smile because you know it, you got it, baby. Anyway, here's the thing, you manipulated the valley. And why, when I walked around and I talked to old valley and I've been here since 72 and I wasn't even born here. But when you see the roots come out, it's amazing. And we're grabbing those roots and we're putting fertilizer on those roots and it's going to grow. When I get called a far left and I really, I said after the meeting in May, I met a lady. I said, I'm the most dangerous vote for the Republican Party because I'm a moderate conservative. 
And if you read some articles out there just in the last week, the moderate conservative is a dangerous vote because we're going to vote for the right thing for people. Thank, Thank you. you. Melinda Matus, go ahead. Go ahead and unmute. Okay, Katie M, go ahead. Good evening. There were some speakers tonight and every board meeting really who seem to think that those of us who work for DCSD and show up to almost every one of these school board meetings are here because we have some sort of hidden agenda. What agenda would we have? We are not paid for coming to these meetings. In fact, we are here during our summer break because what happens in these meetings matter to our everyday lives. The only reason we are here is because we are legitimately concerned about how our daily lives will be changed by people who have a very narrow scope of the day in and day out realities we face here in Douglas County School District. Which brings me to ponder, why are there a crew of 10 to 15 people who continue to show up and demean staff and fill our new school board with untruths? You all don't work here. If legal counsel or agenda items are passed, it changes nothing in your daily lives. It changes everything in ours, which is why we show up every time. You question us for being here, it's our job. I would hope that you would like that we are passionate and worried about what's happening with all students and staff. I'm really wondering what your incentive is though. You aren't employed by the school district and don't have students in the district, so what sort of compensation are you getting to be here? You are worried about giving retired teachers extra money instead of being worried about keeping teachers. I have received numerous texts from educator friends in surrounding counties who have started following these appalling, egregious board meetings. They once thought they might want to be employed by Douglas County School District, but the texts I got now outline, I wouldn't touch DCSD with a 10 foot pole with that new board making willy nilly partisan decisions. Oh my gosh, what is happening? This is a complete S show. Firing legal counsel, talk about cancel culture. Who would want to work there? Perhaps the reason we have 74 openings is less based on what we're doing or lack of what we're doing and more because of your behavior. School board, eye contact, knowing time and place as well as inside thoughts versus outside thoughts are all lessons we cover in our SEL standards. Maybe you need to embrace a S maybe you need to embrace SEL for yourselves versus opposing it. It does wonders in the world of respect. Thank you. Anyone else online? Okay. Madeline Kennedy for the record. Um, I would just like to make a suggestion to the board or the superintendent or really anyone who can do anything about it. I'm really appreciative of adding the student represent representative to the future board members, board items list. Um, I have a lot of friends that watch the meetings from home. I have a lot of friends who, you know, want to be here, but, you know, they have sports or they're out of town or, you know, they just can't. Um, and they, they care about these issues. So I just suggest that maybe, and obviously students, we feel like we get surveyed out a lot, but, you know, just find some way, maybe it's a survey, maybe it's, you know, something else where you can really get that student representation from the entire student body, not just, you know, Douglas High, but, you know, at the Lake Schools, um, that way you can get the Lake Schools information, what's going on there. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.
Num number 16, future agenda items. Keith, no closed session? For the record, no closed session. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Linda, oh, sorry. go ahead. You want to start with us first? Or no, you guys go with it. Let's go around. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have a discussion on the role of legal counsel in regard to the district and in regard to board members. And the reason I'd like to have this is because I have a simple uh, perception of it. And that is that Superintendent Lewis runs the district very well, I might add. Um, we govern those decisions and Mr. Gilbert is our advisor when we need advice. So if I have that completely under control, I just want to know that if what we're using our legal advice for. So we obviously, it, the bottom line is I want to know exactly uh, what the parameters are for a board member to talk to legal counsel for uh, the district and what the uses are for the district for the legal counsel. And I just want to have that discussion. And I think it's very timely since we now have new legal counsel. So I'd like to make that motion. I'll second it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Just clarification. Um, so more just a discussion at what point is the district using legal counsel? When would we make contact with uh, Mr. Gilbert? When would a board member individually exactly. seek out legal counsel? Is that how you, is that how we understood that? Yes. Okay. So just a discussion, uh, information, or information, just a discussion, discussion okay. and uh, for the knowledge of ourselves and for the knowledge of the public. Okay. Well, I mean, it's a traditional council role. I mean, I take questions pretty consistently throughout the week right now on as we're you know, the changing of the, the guard, so to speak. Well, this is a future agenda item, right? Or do We'll put okay. it on future. I appreciate. Well, I just, but I just want to say that's that's what I think we should direct towards is you know there's a lot of questions going on right now and that's what I really want to make sure everyone understands is that's okay. kind of there's I think there's gonna be a little more front loading then I think it'll won't be as much involvement. All right. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. That's it. Thank you, President Jansen. Um, my future agenda item really comes from the people, from the community. Um, also for myself, you did apologize and I felt it was very sincere and thank you for doing that. But it was a little bit too late. Um, number seven on our board of code of conduct states and it was stated earlier today, I'll just kind of go through it very quickly, that board members carry a public trust and should carry out their duties in a professional and courteous manner. Board members should strive to present their views in a professional, respectful manner, working with fellow board members in the spirit of harmony and cooperation in spite of differences of opinion. Also, board members should extend every courtesy to those who appear before the board. Nonverbal communication must be respectful. It also says that violations of the code of conduct will be addressed by the board president. Well, we have a situation here where the violation of the board conduct was committed by the board president when she called a public commenter a piece of shit. Sorry for my profanity. It's quote. Therefore, I suggest that we have an agenda item to censure President Jansen's behavior. And I did hear that a few times this evening. I believe that this item is timely. And I suggest that it is placed on September's agenda so that students, employees, and community know that we take our code of conduct seriously. Thank you. I'm going to second that for discussion.
I propose a discussion on the lake schools and what we could do to increase in, in employment or funding or whatever to keep our lake schools viable. So any ideas would be appreciated. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Trustee Burns. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to uh, have a, a agenda item on uh, bylaws number 060, article six, and it's titled meetings, uh, sections 4A and 4B. I would like to have it uh, for uh, uh, general discussion and possible action, but to look at this and discuss, because we've been doing this of different items through, uh, um, through the bylaws and policies. And this is just one more that I feel we need to look at, discuss it, and um, maybe make some changes. So agenda item on uh, section 4A, 4B, on meetings of the bylaw, number uh, zero, 060, Article 6. Do I have a, sec do I have a second? Second. <laughs> Trustee McNana. Do you have any future agenda items? No, I don't. Thank you. Trustee Dickerson. Could I just make a quick comment? Or is this not the time? Oh, is this just not the time? I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, in regards to Linda Gilgerson and what she just read, nonverbal communications, I think you need to check yourself on that as well, my friend. Thank you, Ms. Gilgerson. Go ahead. Go ahead, Doug. Um, I, I just would like to go ahead and uh, bring forward uh, Madeline Kennedy's request that we discuss um, that we discuss having a student representative and how that would work and whether it would be the same person every time or whether we were just a discussion on that. So that's already on our future for October. Oh, it is on yep. the, okay. Never mind. Linda? Yes. Um, Ms. Dickerson, I, I have sit up here for six and a half years and I do look at the people that are talking to me. I think your comments would be better spent looking at some of your other board members possibly that do not make eye contact, that these people have that come here and don't feel that they're being respected. So if you want me to check myself, check yourself and have everyone check themselves. I stand for myself only. And I can tell you, if you look at every meeting, I look directly at the people, will continue to do that because I give them that respect for all the hours. Yes, ma'am, I do. And so do I. Well, that's an, go ahead. Okay, we're, we're looking at this for tit for tat, whatever you want to call it back and forth. Fact is, I think every one of us board members sitting here at one time or another could be uh, uh, censored. We could call for a censor. Oh, I, I'm just making a statement, yeah. my see. opinion, and we'll discuss that when it comes up in the future. Uh, we I, have it I on the just, agenda. I would like to have one more comment, please. Go ahead. Likewise, uh, um, six years, six and a half years since 2017, uh, there's been a lot of very pressured, high profile meetings and decisions made. I never used that word. I never disparaged anybody in the crowd. I think it's beyond the pale of a president of the board to do that. So that's my reasoning for seconding the motion. Any other future agenda items? We'll go to the next public comment.
Yes, final public comment. Casey Rogers for the record. Um, I was very rudely interrupted when I was speaking and I'm pretty sure there, there may or may not be, I will find out for sure. Um, if there is a policy against when somebody is speaking, the crowd speaking over them. And if it is, um, if it is not in the policy, I'm asking that it be put into an agenda item so that um, that doesn't happen again. It was very rude listening to people talk over people tonight. Um, a lot of the people that are here haven't been here for the past four years and all of a sudden they're coming because you guys came and are making waves. So um, note that the good old boy club is present. Um, what else did I wanna say? Oh, back to the defibrillators. So these teenagers in our schools and across the nation, um, there's many athletes that are healthy young people who are falling dead on the courts, on football fields, on tracks, you need to look it up and you need to find out what's going on because um, the vaccine, the bioweapon is taking its toll on our youth. So I would really appreciate some automatic heart defibrillators throughout these buildings for our children. All because of the last leadership. Just keeping that in mind. Thanks. Virginia Neese for the record. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, I called uh, Linda Gilkerson out a couple of board meetings ago for a rude comment by just saying out loud, rude, and she acknowledged it. So if we're gonna call the kettle black, it's all recorded. We got it down on tape. To conclude with my last thing, as for the last two meetings, we heard about some 60 letters that were sent to school board trustees regarding their objection to the recent removal of the former legal counsel and appointment of Joey Gilbert. Upon reading these letters, most of the trustees stated that the letters all had the same verbiage and tone. This is an organized attack clearly from a core group of people who do not represent the whole of Douglas County, but a group of left-leaning employee citizens affiliated possibly with the Democratic Party. I would venture to say that the 70 survey names likely match up to the 60 emails sent. Do not be fooled. A new Jason Aldean song came out and it's getting a lot of attention. It's called Try That in a Small Town. We are a small town and we don't play this game. Wake up, smell a coffee, folks. You're being fed a stream of misinformation and lies. These new trustees are working for you to stop the encroachment of wokeism coming across our nation and our world. You will hear from the left, it's not here in Douglas over and over again, but it is, or the 60 or 70 people who would be fighting so hard to silence them would say. Marxists have been working on our schools subtly since the 1960s to erode our values. I think there was an interesting movie in the theaters most recently, it was called The Essential Church. It was about uh, history in the 1600s in Scotland and how the Church of England put up the Book of Common Prayer, which was written by the king to, um, for everybody to use. And the, and the several people in the congregations there said, no, we are going to follow the word of God. And then it goes into COVID and how COVID shut down our country and how people were not allowed to worship. These things are happening in our world. They're subtle, they're slow, and they come like a thief in the night. It's time people woke up. Wokeism is coming and we don't want it here in our small town. I'd like to take a 10 minute recess and then we'll come back. You'll be first. Leslie Hokinson. Um, I don't even know what I really want to say other than other than Susan Jansen calling people a piece of shit. I was really disturbed uh, several meetings ago when Doug Englehart got up and made quite a lengthy statement. Um, 
calling LGBTQ citizens having mental disabilities. I don't see the initials MD on your, your name tag there. Um, I don't understand why so many people in this room, on the board and in this room, they're always calling people names. They're always saying they're communists, they're Marxists, they're this, they're the that. I, and I might be wrong, I don't remember any of us that have different opinions of you getting up and I wouldn't even know what to call you. I mean, I wouldn't call you a Marxist. I wouldn't call you a communist. I would just say that you have a different opinion or view. I don't understand why you guys have to keep calling names like this. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. And it doesn't make any sense to me that anything is ever going to get accomplished if you keep calling each other names all the time. We just have different opinions. I guess we could get up and call you all pieces of shit too, but we haven't. And I wish that every single one in here that keeps calling people names would stop it. We just have different opinions, different opinions. And we don't need to be called and you don't need to be calling people that. I don't think that's the American way. I'm, I'm looking at all of you, everybody that- Mrs. Holkinson, just please address the board. Thank okay. you. Well, I'm just saying that no one on the board ever stops anybody from saying these things. It's very offensive. And I just don't think it's necessary. Just people have difference of opinions. We're just all here because we want what's best for the kids. And with all these people getting up, calling people pieces of shit, communists, Marxists, whatever, really isn't accomplishing anything. And it just causes problems. Thank you. I want to get rid of it. James McCallum for the record. Um, I've probably been to close to 100 county commissioner meetings. I'm on the Rancho's board. I'm the vice chairman. I'm very familiar with public meetings. I've never seen the amount of shouting out from the group. I mean, I've never seen that. And um, I think it's something to keep your meetings in order that you need to consider. That's improper. It's improper in a public meeting. The uh, I've never in a public meeting ever cheered or booed anybody. It's not it's not right. It's not how you behave in a public meeting. I think these meetings need to uh, be. You know, I think one thing make them more civilized. If people would wait their turn, make their public comment, and not make public comment by shouting during someone else's speaking. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, Brian Trudy, and he took my story. <laughs> but I'd like to add to that. Um, I'm a retired firefighter in town. And for the last six years I was there, we had a fire board and I attended many of those meetings, being as I knew many of the people that were on the board. And to see what has gone on today, like he said, the comments, the it's not a football game. It's not a back, boxing match. This is supposed to be an organized meeting. Enough of that. Um, I think we're losing focus about what's going on here. Um, you folks got voted in. Um, I don't want to say we're stuck, but you're there. You got to make this work. I wasn't here on time for the meeting because I've had to work. Yes, I'm retired, but I'm not really. I'm still working full time. But I got wind that something has come up with Mr. Lewis's position being attacked. I haven't have known Keith Lewis for a very long time. My daughter went through the entire school system here. I've moved down here in 87. She was born in 92. She had him in elementary school. I've known Keith for, she's 30. I've known him 25 years. To let something like that get away 
that depth of knowledge and experience would be a travesty. He has not only the education and the experience, but he knows this, this valley. He knows this school district. Unfortunately, that can't be said the same for the board. This is not an attack, it's a fact. He's got the education behind him and not only him, but a vast majority of the teachers and administrators. They need to be listened to by the board and keep this thing on track. It's swirling out of control. And I just think that the focus is being lost. Thank you. <clears throat> Marty Switzer, Gardner Gardnerville resident. Um, I just wanted to step back and uh, say that I'm gonna be sending you more information about testing. Uh, I agree with many of you that uh, testing is important, but it's a snapshot in time. The real education that our students get is in the classroom. And we wanna remember that. Uh, for example, I had to cut this out earlier, but um, on the 2022 ACT testing, if you go back and look at the form I sent you, you'll see that there were six states that tested 100% of their juniors. Okay, of those six states, only one exceeded Douglas County's 18.1 um, composite score, and that was Wyoming. The others, the other states are below us. So I'm, I'm really troubled because I invested a lot of time and energy in this district in making sure that kids got a quality education, that we continue as a society to demean the education because of a test score. Please look at them, they're important, but they're not the end all be all. Um, I just wanna say lastly, most importantly, the ACT is only required participation as a graduation requirement in Nevada schools. It is not anything more than that. The real threshold for graduation is the daily work in our classrooms and the careful assessment of our teachers in order for a student to make it to graduation and achieve a Douglas County High School diploma, he or she must minimally pass three classes of English and math and two classes of social studies and science in the middle school and at least four classes of English and three classes of math, three classes of social studies and three classes of science at the high school. This means that each student has to work with and be verified for content knowledge and functional literacy in each subject by 10 middle school teachers and 13 high school teachers. Students who, are not function, students who are not functioning literate in core subject areas and skills are not receiving a diploma in Douglas County School District. Our kids are prepared and I'm proud of it. Thank you. Thank you. Adrian Sawyer, for the record, parent of three DCSD students. Uh, I want to ad address a couple of things. Uh, first, I take issue with the spokesperson for the board majority and others in her group who continue to dismiss all of us that email the board, participate in the parent group, and show up to these meetings as an organized effort against the board. Yes, I disagree. The direction the board is choosing. It is choosing to listen to those without any blood, sweat, and tears in this district. The board's actions directly affect my heart, my children. I take it personally. Uh, second, under Nevada Constitution and the law, a transgendered girl is a girl and a transgendered boy is a boy. When you add the phrase from birth, the policy becomes a transgendered policy. Third, I have heard President Jansen admit to not reading emails from the superintendent. Mr. Byrne told Joey Gilbert at the last meeting that he hadn't read what he had submitted or something to that effect. This, that is your job. You are trying to use the superintendents as a scapegoat for not doing your job. He has saved this board from numerous open meeting law violations. He has handled the board and its spokespeople's insults with class and defended himself with facts and supporting documents. As a parent, I 100% support Superintendent Lewis. Hi, my Make name's... Okay. Megan Kelly, go ahead. 
Hi, this is Megan Kelly again. again. I just just wanted to say a few things um, more about some of the great speakers that spoke up today. I wanted to thank them. And especially the people who they feel like maybe they don't fit in in this county anymore. Maybe they want to leave. I I hope they stay. We support you. And I don't think these meetings are reflective of the kind of community this is. I want to kind of address something one of the speakers said a couple speakers ago named Virginia. I would say that the generation right now raising kids in these schools, we're like the Columbine generation. Like we, we were in high school when Columbine happened and we really think social emotional learning is important so that there's not school shootings. I, I feel really strongly about it. And I feel like if you didn't go through that, if you weren't in high school during that, like you won't feel that same way. And that's why there's generational change. Like it's not always going to be the same. There's going to be generational change because things happen and they affect us. You know, 9-11 happened to us. You know, there's many, many things that happened to us, just like World War II might have happened to you guys. And we weren't part of that. So, so things are going to change because we're a new generation. And lastly, I want to address kind of the accusation that the verbiage was the same in letters that we sent. Again, I'd like to stress that we are busy parents. We do not have time to constantly be writing letters, writing unique letters. You know what we are? We are a community of parents. We're not (laughs) sent by the Democratic Party. We're sent by each other. We meet at the beach. We meet at a kid's play dates and we say, have you heard what's happening at the school board? Hey, I'll take the turn writing the letter and let's send it out to other parents. And yeah, we'll probably copy some of the verbiage because I got five minutes free time today to work on this issue. So I just want to say that, and I just think it's really important, and thank you for everybody that put themselves out there today and is dedicated to bettering the school environment for our children. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adam Lassier, for the record. Um, I'm here to, to speak in support of Keith Lewis. Um, there, He's... Um, currently being attacked by a couple uh, community members that spoke uh, earlier tonight in earlier public comment. Um, They're trying to make the case that, you know, he should be um, relieved or, you know, put under some some sort of temporary leave uh, because of a certain employee situation. As a former employee here who worked, I don't know, a decade or two under Keith Lewis, along with my wife, uh, who worked um, directly under him at um, at Paul Lou when he was principal there, and both of us working directly under him as superintendent. Um, the accusation that Keith would somehow knowingly put up with an employee who was going down these kind of roads that he's being accused of is laughable. Um, I know the man personally. He um, he's, he's, if, if anything, he leads on, he, he leans on being too tough on his employees. Um, his, his employees are, we, he's the kind of leader that, that you don't want to disappoint. Um, he's the kind of leader that you want to work hard for and that you, you want him to respect you. Um, and yet if you do, if you are one of those employees that chooses to step out of line. Um, He comes down on you hard. He comes down on you swiftly. And so these accusations that somehow he knowingly hired somebody that, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's laughable. It is ridiculous. I don't know the story. I don't know the, I don't know any of the situations, but this is, uh, it is laughable on its face. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. it on? Yes. Uh, Cindy Arvile for the record. Um, I'm fairly new to attending these types of meetings, the school board meetings. I've been to a couple of them. Um, and I, I have to, I had to speak up because I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm shocked and saddened. And I can, I, I have experience being on boards. I have experience in leadership and management, running meetings, sitting in meetings. And after sitting in this meeting, 
I can see why maybe we don't get much done uh, that is for the betterment of the schools and the kids because of all of the backbiting that's going on, like, wow. I mean, I would say my best guesstimate is two thirds of this meeting has been about a hot mic instance. I'm not I'm not playing that down and saying whether it was right or wrong, it happened, it happened. Um, but I also sat over here and watched the room just out of curiosity to see what was happening. And we talked earlier, you guys were talking about body language. It's huge. You may not be saying words, but you're making a statement by all the, the, the back and forth eye rolling and all of this that's going on in the first three rows of this room. Uh, I don't think that's cool. Somebody else come up earlier and said, we need to keep the meeting under control. We need to not that have people speaking out while somebody else is trying to speak because it makes you feel like what you're saying doesn't mean anything. It's not important. You don't need to be heard. I think a meeting that's held in control gets a lot more done. I personally, would like to see as a resident of Douglas County, um, a lot less time spent in uh, our, our personal vendettas against other people on the board or whatever. And I'd like to see this board get to work and get some actual real work done. Not this business of you said, he said, they said, who cares? We're not here. To, to tear each other down. The purpose of the board is to get something done for the kids, yes? Is that true? Okay, I'm on the right track here then. Even though I've only been to a couple of these meetings, it's pretty clear that that's what the purpose is. And the people that are here wouldn't be here unless they cared. Doesn't matter that you have a kid in or out of the district. You care or you wouldn't be spending your time here. You guys, I'm sure could be doing something else this evening as with the rest of us. So I would like to say going forward that the focus of this meeting stays on school and the kids and not all the, you said, he said, whatever, you know, get over it, move on, let's get the job done. Thank you, Dave, Dave. David Seat, for the record, I'd like to uh, um, defend Doug Engelkirk and his comments that uh, transgenderism <clears throat> is a mental disorder. Um, it was, uh, in, in, uh, it was a mental disorder. It was considered that. Uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders um, it was considered a mental disorder uh, until the, the truth was changed. Um, and it was changed in 1987. So it's not a mental disorder anymore. Um, you know, culture changes definitions. Uh, we're not in a recession anymore it, right now. Well, they changed the definition of recession, so we're not in one. Uh, they changed the definition of a vaccine. What, what, that that, that bioweapon that Casey has talked about um, it's not a vaccine, but, but the definition has been changed. So these terms are changed to suit the culture. And I'm gonna tell you, there's one book that doesn't change and that's the Holy Bible. That's the truth. It has not changed for over 2000 years. It's the same then as it is now, but culture wants to change their definitions of these terms to suit their um, agendas. Uh, you know, truth is, is not, um, it doesn't evolve. Truth is, period. Thank you. Thank you. Nick Meyer for the record. <clears throat> um, I'm concerned that the board is not taking seriously the hiring practices and the processes for background checks that caused this individual to be hired as a teacher in the Douglas County School District 
who was subsequently arrested for stalking. There is no excuse for the district not to be able to determine the criminal background of an individual before they hire them. Now, I am urging the board to put this as an agenda item on their next meeting to get some definitive action going because we have to hire 74 people. And if we have a broken system where we're not doing background checks on people, who knows who we're gonna hire? I mean, this person was arrested for stalking. He's a defendant in a civil case where he assaulted a special ed student. I urge the board to put this on their agenda to tighten up these hiring practices. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take online. Courtney Jeffries, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Fantastic. So um, look, to all the people who have stood up and have talked tonight um, about Christian values, I'm a Christian, but guess what? We are a public school. That means that everyone belongs in a public school, even transgender children. We do not have the right to say that someone doesn't belong because they do not fit your values as a Christian. Christianity at its foundation is about love and acceptance. It's not about hate. And basically, I 100% think that Susan and the rest of the board should be held accountable for what they have said and what they have done. I personally was the one who was quoted in the paper for the last board meeting. I'm not there tonight because my husband's at work and I cannot leave my child alone. But I was the one who was quoted in the meeting. And every time that I have spoken in person, I have had eyes rolled. I have had no one paying attention to me except for Linda and for Tony Kangas or for Mr. Kangas. I'm not sorry, Mr. Carey, I apologize. And I'm a little upset right now. And the rest of you have not paid attention to me. You have not given me any type of acceptance. You have not listened to me. You have played on your phones. You have rolled your eyes at me. And the fact that you have done it to everyone else that is stands up against what you say, what you believe in is absolutely uncalled for. You are a public servant. You are here to serve the children of this district and you are not doing it. You are not doing it. I also wanna stand up for Mr. Keith Lewis. He is the heart and soul of this district. And if he leaves, we will go further down the drain than we are already going. And we are going to go fast if he leaves. He is the glue that is holding this place together right now. He is the reason that our children are getting an education. He is the reason that we are retaining the teachers that we do have that have not wanted to leave because of all this craziness that is happening. He is the reason that we are still here. He is the reason that the employees are still here. We are here for the children and we believe in Keith Lewis. And he is the reason that we are still trying to do our jobs in this district. So please listen to us, listen to the parents, listen to the staff, listen to the children. Keith Lewis is who we need. You're not who we need. Thank you. Lauren Larson, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Uh, my name is Lauren Larson. Um, I'm a parent of a student in district. I also have um, a young child who will hopefully be attending in about a year. Um, I just wanted to reach out. I've, I've written the board some letters, um, my own letters, shockingly. I actually write them myself. And um, I have never heard a response from the four board members, uh, Mr. Engelkirk, President Jansen, Mr. Burns, and Ms. Dickerson. Um, and with the questions that I've asked in these, these emails, um, which have been respectful and honestly, just a very, I'm curious of, of how things are, are working. Um, you guys are the only ones that can answer these questions. And I'm shocked because I've seen the emails you've written back to other people. Um, on issues that aren't important, <laughs> to be honest. 
Um, and so my, my question was about who reviewed Mr. Gilbert's contract. Um, I don't want to go through that whole mess again, but I am genuinely concerned about that. Um, because um, I did receive a response from Ms. Gilkerson, as well as Mr. Magnata, they can't answer that question because they didn't vote in support of it. Mr. Lewis responded. Um, I also asked a question about the budgeting because of the increase in fees. He was able to answer that question for me. But when it came down to that contract, even he said staff and the prior law firm that we worked with uh, were not did not review the contract. So it's really concerning to me because I did see that that had Joey Gilbert letterhead on it, which means that that's his contract. When generally in those cases, and what I saw in the prior agreement with the old law firm, we would normally use our own contract, a Douglas County contract that is written in the best interest of the school district. And so that is my question, who reviewed that agreement? I would I would love to know that answer. And it's scary to me if, if only Mr. Gilbert reviewed that agreement. Um, as a follow-up to this, um, you know, it's really concerning to me with kids in the district and a future child in the district that when I turn on the news, when I see Douglas County in the news, Douglas County School District, it's for this dysfunctional circus school board meetings that we constantly have. But then I go out and I see other school districts doing really great things that I would love to see our school district focusing on. Um, one thing I saw was Carson City has raised the um, salaries for new teachers to be the highest in the entire state. Wow, I applaud them. That's amazing. I wish we were talking about things like that. Another thing I saw was Washoe County School District is offering free universal lunches for all students. Our governor just vetoed that, so that will not be available for our students going forward. And so the fact that Washoe County is offering that, I think that's amazing. And I would love to see some of these things now available in our school district or, or some good news. I want to make the news because Douglas County School District is doing great things instead of just bringing dysfunction to this whole process. Thank you Thank very you. much. Go ahead, Maddie. Madeline Kennedy. I was ignorant. And being ignorant doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means that there's some information out there you've let, let yet to learn. I was ignorant of some issues being here today. I was ignorant of the change I can make while sitting here in front of you. I've only been here a couple of months, but I read through every word of the agenda, every word of presentations and resolutions, every word of the superintendent goals and the DCSD strategic plan that some of you, some of you haven't even read. I sit from beginning to end for six to seven hours listening to this roundabout way of just getting nothing really productive done. When I miss a meeting, I read every minute of that meeting. There has to be some growth and change and some effort to understand each other to do what's best for the students and teachers. If I, as a 16-year-old high school junior can, you can too. All of you want what's best for students. I genuinely, genuinely believe that. You just have different ideas of how to get there and that's okay, but you have to work together. There has to be something to change from this. Maybe do some icebreakers or team building <laughs> to get some real solutions put in place. Thank you. Thank you. Tomasa Miller. Um, I just wanted to address something that was brought up about the defibrillators and the AEDs. And I just want um, people to be rest assured that there is an AED on every campus and teachers are trained in that in the beginning of the year. So when we go back on Wednesday, I think ours is like Thursday. So we all get training on the AEDs every year. Um, I also just wanted to talk to you guys about the impact of an educator and the relationship that they build. And the first time that I met Mr. Lewis is when he moved here and he um, was at GES and he was our new PE teacher. And I wasn't lucky enough to have him because um, I had moved on to the middle school, but my brother and my sister got to have Mr. Lewis. And I want to tell you that it's a not common to have someone who starts out as a teacher right out of college and then they stay here and they become our superintendent. It's also not common for someone like Mr. Lewis who remembers your face and remembers your name and makes sure that as a new employee coming back here, um, 
I felt more welcome than I have in any other district. My husband was in the army for 16 years before he was medically discharged. And so I had to move a lot. This is actually the first place I'm not on probation and I'm very excited about it. Um, the longest job I ever had prior to this was two and a half years because of his orders. It's so exciting to have it be in my hometown and to have it be in this valley. And I wanna just have you all know that obviously that person doesn't work here anymore. And I know that they are tirelessly making sure that we have the best for our students. And I would not, I would never characterize anyone that works at the district office to be a person that would acknowledge or accept that behavior for any of us. So I applaud all of you for doing research and finding these things out and helping to make sure that we have the best teachers possible. But again, I just would hope that we can stop attacking the people that are day in and day out working for our students and learn how we can come together to make sure that Douglas becomes a lighthouse school district again. I know we can do it. We this is such a gem of a district. We can do this. It's not easy, but we can do this. Um, thank you, Mr. Lewis, for all the things that you have done for our staff and for protecting us and for making us feel welcome and accepted. And um, empowered and validated. I know it's not easy and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, Laura Cadeau. <clears throat> Sorry. So I wanted to address the incident that happened on the 19th again, because so many people seem to be trying to play it down. The video speaks for itself. President Jansen, you were sitting in front of an open meeting. You had just come back from a break. Mrs. McGuffin had started the conversation, was the first person to speak. And when she was done, you intentionally made a remark and it was directed towards trustee Dickerson, but I suspect was heard by everybody sitting at your table. It was malicious, it was intentional, it violated NRS codes. And for that reason, I support the motion made by um, trustee Gilkerson. I would also like to say that in these meetings, um, in reviewing them, attacks towards Superintendent Lewis have been frequent. And so I have been asking around, I've been in this community a long time, trying to figure out from parents, trying to figure out from teachers that I know what the problem is. And I cannot find anyone who says anything that isn't glowing about him. I myself do not know him but I have seen him working in these meetings. And I have to say, he does a wonderful job trying to keep this board on track. Uh, I heard someone say earlier that his fidelity is with the board. As someone who spent 30 years in this community working for an elected official, that is untrue. The fidelity is to the community always. I think you're doing a wonderful job, Mr. Lewis, and I just wish this board appreciated you. Finally, I would like to say that over and over again, I've heard students say they want student representation. I've heard several students speak. I'm so impressed with them. I think all of us could learn from these students, and I'd like to start seeing them on this board as non-voting members, of course, but that's something you should be working towards. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jen Nalder. For the record, I'm with Main Street Gardnerville. And this is on a slightly different note. I know that there's been some very heavy tones tonight. So um, I'm here on behalf of Main Street Gardnerville to extend our gratitude for um, the school district for finding value in restoring one of our most historic buildings in the downtown Gardnerville. Um, I did reach out to Mr. Lewis earlier just to find out who was behind this project. And he had informed me that your director of facilities, Phil Demas, was the one to make sure that this project was 
was seen through. Um, as he informed us in the community, it would be glad to hear that this project started from an insurance claim when the roof caved in and from there, they were able to budget, you were able to budget money to finish the exterior so that you didn't have a blight in the community. As a Main Street Gardnerville program, it is our it is our core mission to make sure that we do not lose any of our buildings in the downtown. I had my first school dance in the old gym playhouse. And I think that we have a lot of memories that go well beyond my years at CVMS. And to make sure that you are a good steward of these buildings and also the museum next door, it, it just means a lot to our community. So I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank Phil. And I wanted to thank the school district for finding the value and the budget to make sure that this happens before we lost another building. And on a side note, I would just like to really thank um, trustee Gilkerson for bringing up all of our uh, coming up events. Thank you for being present and paying attention to that and filling in. And I wanted to thank you all for your hard work that you do. I know this job is not easy. Um, I went to Douglas High, Douglas CVMS, CC Manili, and I've been in the school district since 1984. Um, I have raised a Douglas High graduate who is now um, serves in the U.S. military, and I have three students who are still in the school district, so this school district means a great deal, not only to my family, but to the community, so please keep that in mind when you go forward making decisions on our behalf, and thank you for all you do. Thank you. That was very nice. Uh, Virginia Starrett, for the record. Uh, I think maybe this will answer the person who came up here previously who was upset about the term Marxist being used. It's not a pejorative. It's not a swear word. It describes a way of thinking. And so when you're trying to um, use the shortcut, because you only have three minutes anyway, of explaining something, you sometimes use words that encapsulate meanings like that, that are, that are representative of something. A culture war has been raging in education for at least the last 20 years at the K-12 level and for the last five decades in the world of educators. And that has finally brought a laundry list of Marxist notions into popularity and into published curriculum. The list includes patriotism is fascism, capitalism is oppressive, children belong to the state, religion is hate, the US constitution is an evil document and all white people are racists. Most recently, the science of sex became the target with hysterical insistence there is no such thing as a woman anymore and the addition of 87,000 genders. To hold the view that somehow a high percentage of university graduates for some, time, for some time haven't been provided an education with a biased political stance is deeply naive, considering the fact that the ratio of college professors who are Democrats to those that are Republicans is 17 to 1, and that of the 66 top-rated liberal arts colleges, 39% had not a single registered Republican professor on their staff. How did higher ed become so imbalanced? Well, since the 1970s, there has been a deliberate strategy employed by Marxists called the long march through the institutions to take over all American institutions, including transforming all university ed departments with what is identified as Ferrarian Marxism. By 1995, they succeeded and Marxist Ferrarian pedagogy reigned supreme. Almost all teachers today were taught in alignment with Marxist Ferrarian pedagogy, but they are blameless, entirely blameless, because that pedagogy permeates almost all teaching materials and approaches to every subject. Only a discerning superintendent with a discerning board has any chance of keeping the schools under his supervision safe at all from Marxist Ferrarian pedagogy. Not much can be done once a mandated curriculum connected to a grant or textbooks laced with social justice blather are assigned or the teachers are forced to comply with teacher training that asserts Marxist ideals. Sadly, this district does not have that discerning superintendent. Instead, it has caved to the long march under the excuse that it is simply following the law. At least now with the current board majority, Douglas County might have a fighting chance to improve the academic performance at our schools, but to do it, I expect they will have to endure terrible misguided scorn. Thank you.
I would like to know if the board is going to continue to allow Ms. Starrett, Mrs. Starrett to come up here at every meeting and call teachers Marxists. I want to know when this is going to end because what it does, it causes me to then want to come up here and call her a fascist. So is that how you want these school board meetings to continue tit for tat? But somehow, because she was the campaign manager, is still the campaign manager, she gets to come up here at every meeting and, and go on and on about things that do not pertain to the education here in this school district. She can have her opinion. I'm not objecting to that. But I do think that there is an element of, um, you know, political philosophy that she's bringing to the board as well as there is an element of religious philosophy that is coming before the board. I, I, I just, I want you to think about when you're going to allow people to continue on with this because I will get up here at every meeting and I will start calling every one of them. Are you listening to me or are you talking? Oh, well, I put, but maybe Joey doesn't. Um, so if you want that to continue, I'm going to come with prepared speeches to every meeting. And it's going to be all about the right wing fascist mega, whatever names I can come up with, because I'm sick of this. I really am. I'm tired of it. Let's talk about something else. So is there some direction that can be given? No, she can just say whatever she wants at every single meeting on and on. Then I guess I'll get my speeches prepared.